silence of expectancy um, in the room at the moment, or a silence of something or other, but good to see you all. Sorry we're just a few minutes uh, late. We'll make a start, if we may. Simon has asked me to apologise to the members of the public. Um, we don't mean to turn our backs on you, David Sandbach, and others. It's just the way the tables have been organised. Good to see you. Um, and uh, Saloni, who is from NPFT? That's right, that's right. Um, and um, um, is here to, I suppose, part of your development, is that right? Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. A um, couple of welcomes, first of all, um, um, to Pauline Gibson, who is the MPFT um, non executive representative of this museum. Good to see you. You've Thank been you. Nice a little to meet while. everybody. And uh, Councillor Jones, I'm not sure you've been in this, these meetings around this table before. Um, good to see you as well. Do you want to introduce yourself, Sam? Um, this is Paul. Paul. I'll shout. Um, yeah, Councillor Simon Jones, I'm the uh, Shropshire Council portfolio holder for Adelaide Social Care and Public Health, and I'm here today uh, representing our leader, Chris Pitton. Good to see you. Now we've had um, apologies from Leslie Picton, from Sean Davis, Alison Pussy, and from Neil Carr. And we also have via teams Trevor Macmillan and um, who else have we got? Roger. Roger. Um, who for various different reasons haven't been able to be here in person. We weren't quite sure about the hybrid teams arrangement because as you know we had one or two technical glitches the last time. But it looks a lot better this time, gentlemen. Can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. yes. Sounds promising. Sounds promising. Good to see you all. Good, good to see you all. Um, just first of all, I, I suppose we, we, we really need to acknowledge um, the death of the Queen and the anointment of Charles as our new King. Condolences, of course. I'm sure I can uh, offer on behalf of the board to the royal family um, with the death of the Queen. Um, and um, um, we move on. We move on. A few introductory comments, um, and then we'll move into the detail um, of the agenda. Um, we've got a new government, a new Secretary of State, uh, a government that seems to be very focused on delivery. Uh, a Secretary of State who has declared her plan for the NHS for the foreseeable future, published last week, and Simon will say more about that when it comes to his report. Um, it's clear that ICBs are seen as pivotal in terms of the delivery of the government's agenda for health care, uh, and we will do that, of course, whilst continuing to respect the statutory basis <coughs> of NHS trusts and foundation trusts, but the line of sight uh, through ICBs is pretty clear. Um, and the other thing I just want to, to mention is that we've had some important uh, successes uh, since last we met formally as a board. We'll hear more about those later. We've had the strategic outline case for HTP approved, enabling us to move forward to the next phase of the capital redevelopment, and that's been published. Simon will say more later, as I said earlier. We've also had good news about the investment for the elective care hub at PRH in Telford, which we've been arguing for for a little while. That's good news also. Um, so things are moving in those regards in the right direction. However, um, we face significant challenges. And if you have been able to read the panoply of papers that we've sent around with the agenda, you'll see that there's quite a bit for us to do on a number of fronts in terms of urgent and emergency care and in terms of access. And we'll get an opportunity uh, to hear more about that and to learn more about the kind of plans that exist whilst at the same time uh, learning about the uh, urgent and emergency care improvement plan, the winter plan and many other things um, as well. Um, we need to acknowledge that any pressures which the NHS face um, are mirrored at least by our local authority colleagues and the interrelationship between the two local authorities and the NHS remains strong 
Um, but there's a huge amount of, of work for us to do together, for example, to see how we are able to tackle the problem um, of medically fit patients um, for discharge. And whilst all of these things are proceeding, Simon and his executive team are proceeding with the organisational change in terms of setting up um, the um, setting up the ICB. We, we haven't got a management of change process that we can describe as was the case with CCG, in CCG time. There's a huge amount of work being done to redesign, establish new structures and make sure that people are, are feeling as comfortable and as confident as it's possible for them so to do about their place in the new world. Now this is a huge upheaval for many people and that work will continue uh, for some time. Um, so I'd like to move us on if I may. Uh, declarations of interest, as you know the register is available on a website and I haven't had any notification of changes to that so you can take it as written nitty. I have sent you my uh, latest declaration. I think you received it, Alison? That's right, yeah. yes. And it's been updated. Oh, it's been updated to take account of that. And I did remember that. I apologise for not raising it. Thanks very much indeed. Um, so, moving on then, if I may, to the minutes of three previous meetings. Um, the 29th of June, 1st of July, 27th of July. Um, first of all, are you happy with their accuracy? There is an action log which sh schedules the things which we have committed to, the actions we've committed to, and updates on how we have proceeded with them. Are you comfortable with that? There's a couple of things I wanted to raise, if I may, and Simon or somebody will tell me that these are covered elsewhere. Where um, one of them was um, the fuller review we said would come back to the September board meeting. I'm not sure I saw that featured in our papers today, Simon. I may be wrong. Uh, no, you're correct, Chair. It's not in the, the board papers today. Uh, but we've taken a view that uh, with uh, the new government coming into place, uh, the new priorities being set as the ABCD, of which there's a part in there that's specific to general practice. Uh, that we wanted to bring a more detailed, uh, comprehensive uh, report back around general practice that incorporated a fuller review but didn't look at that just in isolation of the work we're trying to do and want to do with general practice. So we want to pull that together in the round that covers the access piece uh, as well as uh, uh, the PCN development piece as well as then the implications of the fuller review for local general practice. Nitty? Will that come to the Primary Care Committee first, Simon? Uh, I would fully expect it uh, yep. to, uh, to as, and as Thank Chair, you. I would want you to be endorsing that before it comes through to the board. And, and I think that would be a great opportunity for us to have a, a substantial discussion around this table about primary care and its development, not just within the context of the Secretary of State's announcements uh, last week, not just within the context of Fuller, but, but in terms of the kind of things we're trying to achieve locally and how we can support and, and galvanise, if you like, primary care even more towards the efforts we're trying to uh, pursue. So let's, let's clock that as a... And I would certainly want our two GP board members to be of playing course. leading roles in that as well. Of sure. course. Um, there was one other thing I spotted, Simon. Again, you might have covered this elsewhere. Um, when we discussed uh, population health management, we said that the CEOs would be seeking to identify resources to deliver the programme. Have CEOs had a chance to debate that yet? Uh, so, uh, I'm colleagues, we've had the conversation about population health management uh, and taken that uh, in terms of uh, the next steps. <coughs> what I've not picked up over the summer, Chair, is uh, whether the progress around those steps has been taken. So I'll uh, take that away as an action and provide an update uh, prior. I'm sorry to carry on uh, no, like sorry. this. But the, on population health management, what would be really great to see, Simon, is also how it fits in with the new finance regime. Uh, really how capitated budgets are going to work, what the activity analysis around this is going to look like. Um, I haven't seen any of that. Possibly it's there somewhere floating around, but I'd love to see it. Uh, uh, so I, uh, so two bits of that, Nitty. I think I'm going to be absolutely honest and straight with you. The population health work that we've done has been uh, building on the drug strategic <laughs> needs assessment, so it builds out in terms of our community need uh, and the data and the intelligence does that. We've not translated that uh, into the capitated budgets then that might be sitting at a place level at this point in time. 
Okay. But we'll have a direction of travel, right, Simon? That's, that's all I'm looking for. Obviously, it's not uh, possible to sorry, do right now. Yeah. But at yeah. least the methodology by which we're going to get there, what's the timeline? Okay. And, it's in, and there's a yeah. finance plan that supports the delivery Correct. of that. But we want to sit that with the place development piece so that as we develop the place, the two place boards, uh, then we've got an infrastructure to land that in so it gets the traction that it needs in that yeah, space. Yeah, and I think that's so important for if we're having any primary care discussion yeah. in terms of, you know, the fuller report. I mean, that's the fuller report is just, just a report, but if we're having a discussion around how we support our general practices and primary care and community services to get somewhere, then I think in the whole we need to have that whole piece available to make that, to have a decent it's discussion. It's a really good point. Yeah. Really good point. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other points people wish to raise, matters arising from previous board minutes? Uh, moving on then to item number 18, questions from members of the public. Um, there have not been any specific questions um, relating to this agenda, but we have an outstanding question that came in, I think, two or three weeks ago. Where's Alison? Well, oh, there you are, right next to me. <laughs> 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 um, uh, a, a question about uh, transport and access vis a vis the health and well being, planned health and well being hub in Shrewsbury. Um, a reply to that's being published, so it's being prepared and will be published within in the next three weeks. weeks. That's right, okay. yeah. Thank you very much indeed. <coughs> um, so, let's move on then to the residence story. Um, the muscular skeletal pathway work is um, an important piece of the ICS strategy, I suppose, and holds lots of ideas and clues and thoughts about how we move forward on a number of fronts in terms of um, clinical pathway redesign and delivery. Um, I'm not sure I have any idea, really, Stacey, about um, what it is you're going to tell us in terms of the patient story, but um, over to you. We look forward to it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Neil. And we've got um, a video. Um, but this month's residence story for board comes from a lady named Anne-Marie, a yoga teacher from Shropshire. Um, and it, within her story, she describes her 18-month journey through uh, the muscular, musculoskeletal pathway relating to problems um, with both her knees um, and hip. At the time of filming, she was still awaiting an appointment uh, with a consultant. Um, she acknowledges the good standard of physiotherapy sessions she's received, but reflects on the time lost and her frustration caused by each joint having to be referred separately. So really key, as you've just mentioned, um, in our work along with the MSK pathway that we, we factor some of this feedback in, into our design. <coughs> My trouble started in June 2020. I had a really sudden onset of pain in my right knee and I thought I just pulled a muscle, um, but it carried on. And sometimes the pain was so sharp, I couldn't put any weight on it. And sometimes a dull ache that sort of moved around the kneecap area. So I phoned and they prescribed naproxen, which helped a great deal. Um, it really got rid of the pain, but having taken them for some time, I and a further follow-up call from the doctors, I was referred to the MSK for um, a physio appointment. Again, it was over the phone because of COVID, and we went through a series of questions and answers and movements that she asked me to do. Um, and I explained that as a yoga practitioner and teacher, that I was already doing most of these movements and they were part of my daily routine. So I was then referred for an X-ray as I hadn't already had one at this point, and she said it sounded like arthritis. Um, I had the x-ray, but that was very non-conclusive, so an MRI scan was then planned, and I uh, had that at the end of December. In April, um, I got another phone call from the MSK with a different person, and they went through exactly the same as I'd already done with Heidi, so it was sort of like a duplicate of what we'd already done. Um, and at the end of that, I was told that I 
could baby offered be offered an injection into my knee if it didn't improve with exercise in the three months. By August, I had pain in both knees and also my left hip, which has been troublesome on and off for a few years, had also started to kick in. I then phoned the MSK unit myself to arrange a further appointment because nothing had improved. She could only look at my right knee because that was the only thing that had been referred. So even though I'd got pain in my left knee and also starting in my hip, she couldn't look at anything else. And in the meantime, I went back to the GP and asked them if they could refer me for my left knee and my left hip. They organised um, x-rays for both of these and the x-rays were done on the same day, one after the other. But the knee result came back five weeks before the hip result, by which time the knee had been referred on to MSK, but not the hip. So I had a further telephone appointment with the MSK in December, and I was hoping that everything would be referred then and I'd be everything would be happening all at once. But no, it was just the left knee. So here we are 18 months down the line. I'm still experiencing pain on a daily basis. And I, it would be nice if I could get something resolved. And it would also, also be nice if I could have got everything resolved in one go, instead of having to do it bit by bit by little bit. Um, if I could have been looked at as a whole person, so that when I said, yes, I know I've been referred for my night, right knee, but can you please also take into account my left knee and my left hip? And that would have all helped saving me going backwards and forwards to the GP, saving them sending letters to you, saving you sending letters to me to make more appointments. And um, it could have been dealt with swiftly, quickly, and with a lot less hassle. Stacey, any, any, any comments? I mean, what an extraordinary example of a non-integrated service. Yeah, and I think which, as I said at the beginning, I think highlights the reason, the work that we're doing, certainly starting at this point around the triage element, which here in the story, there are positives I take from the triage, you know, instead of referring straight on to a consultant, for example, that physiotherapy review, etc. that's key that we keep that element of it. But in relation to how that part of the service flows, i.e. between imaging, um, referrals, GP, etc., we absolutely need to, to streamline that further. Nigel, I don't know anything you want to add from the work that we've been doing around triage. Yeah, I'm, I'm only... Um Chair that I've, I've been working uh, obviously with uh, as the SRO for the MSK work <coughs> of, of Stacey. I think the only bit I would reiterate is that we are we've got uh, within the transformation group of primary care plus all three of the provider trusts and the point around referral and, and having a um, streamlined referral process that is clear for everybody, including first contact practitioners as well as obviously general practitioners themselves but also the three trusts with the community trust, Robert Jones and SAF, the therapists, uh, teams that often have uh, similar, if not the same, and we just across the geography of, um, of, of the county, I just have divided that up just simply because of the numbers and the, and the challenge. Um, but there is a massive amount of <coughs> joint work um, across that to make sure that we're consistent in the approach, and that will make it easier for our patients to navigate, but it will also make it easier for further up that referral process, general practice and the first contact practitioners to be clear about that pathway and therefore the, the, um, uh, the direction and uh, advice to patients being clearer. Um, I'd like to get a, a general practice view on this in just a moment if I may, but have, has, has your group got a patient representative on it, within it? Um, it? It hasn't on the actual MSK board, but patients have been involved in the workshops yeah. Um, we've also um, been setting up what's called a clinical advisory group <coughs> and our clinical lead, who's actually a, physio, a physiotherapist, um, has, has been speaking to uh, a variety of people to be on that, um, that clinical advisory group. Yeah. And Healthwatch supported us earlier on in the programme as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just wondered whether you might like to ask Anne-Marie if she'd be interested in joining your group. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, primary care is presumably this is not... Uh, 
an unusual tale for you guys? No, I mean, I would say it's a fairly typical story. I mean, one thing to take away from that view is I don't think that, that patient has even got to see the consultant yet. Yeah. They're not yet into that loop where they see the consultant and they're then listed and it's 18 months away and they contact the hospital and they're told to get back to GP to write another letter. So that's only one small part of the pathway um, that we've seen there. We've yet to see the bit which is at on that are really big today. I think one thing I'd like to see is a more consistent application of the, of the pathway. I think this refer we had a case this week where a similar story with right and left feet and you know Robert Jones turned down the request to have the patient initiated follow-up because it was the wrong foot, despite it being mentioned in the letter. So I think there needs to be a, a, a look at that that consistent pathway and a consistent application for it. And also a timeline would be useful because I have no idea today when I refer a patient when they're going to be seen by anyone. I can't give the patient any indication when they will be seen. It's just, you know, it's, it can be a lottery. Some people can be seen quite quickly. Some people are seen very, you know, the time seems to take a much longer for the same problem. So I think a information out of practice, and that across all specialists, it's not just orthopaedics, is, is one thing that we are you know, lacking in this system. Thank you. Did you I, yeah, the only thing I would add is it's about, like Julian said, this is not a typical, it's not just exclusive to <coughs> musculoskeletal uh, system. It's the fact that specialists should be able to refer between, amongst themselves or even within their own service. Because I, I, I get it that therapists are supposed to have X minutes for per condition. If the patient has come say, actually, I've got six more joints, I've got issues, the, cl the clinician will say, mm, actually, it's going to put time pressure on me, so it's not going to be possible. But how does that then get um, referred within the loop? That's going to be important. So someone with a right knee problem, they can, okay, I also got a left knee problem. So can that be referred in-house? Um, so you might have to follow up some other time. But it's, it is about that patient journey, patient flow. So they don't have to go back to the GP and get referred again. So even that can solve a lot of the logistic issue. The triage component is going to be important, but if patients say, the GP refer and say, I've got one problem, and when they present on triage, I've got 10 problems uh, with joints, then what do you do? So it's, it's about the pragmatism into the actual pathway, how it's going to get done uh, in, in a realistic way. Thank you, Niti. And then I want to bring in a, a health watch perspective as well. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to add that Anne-Marie's story is obviously just one example of quite a few experiences of this, of this issue that health watch here. And yes, we have previously been involved in discussions around the transformation and we're keen to continue to be involved, particularly around the evalu evaluation of any changes to services, but also any reviews of, of what's currently happening. Because I think, as you've said, um, Stacey, it's not about changing everything because there's parts of every process that are, work, that are working and it's about giving people the opportunity to say where it's working but also what needs to change. Yeah. So we are happy to support that when you, when you need us to. Thank you. Uh, My quick observation, I'm, I'm the outside and I still see patients very occasionally now, uh, not in your area. Uh, my quick observation, Neil, on this is almost triage is as if almost sometimes, we, I may be speaking out of turn, is seen triage is to get the patient to the right place at the right time, not to block the referral. So that's kind of the one thing that, that really needs to be... My patients, by the way, hated triage. We called it telephone triage years ago. I'm very old. Uh, and they like to call it uh, telephone-based access rather than triage. They hate the word triage, but one thing I heard. The second thing that I'd like to make a comment and how does this relate to the financial flows that we're talking about? Often that's the incentive for getting things moving. If you look at New Zealand and Canterbury, that's where they made the difference, is really starting to get, you talked about the patient pathway, <clears throat> how much of that, those five visits or six visits, how much that actually cost the healthcare system. Uh, and then finally, my observation, and that's for Nick, I guess, is around patient safety and patient-related outcome measures. How do we measure that in some of these pathways and how do we quantify that? If we don't get that right, we'll never get the flows right because people won't pay attention to them. Thank you. And I wanted to bring Nick in, actually, from a, from a clinical perspective. Um, are, there, are there concerns about risks in terms of clinical practice? Or, or would clinicians appreciate, we've heard from primary care, how much 
a streamlined system would be appreciated by um, primary care. What, what's your, your overall view about clinical issues? On the risk, it's all about people, um, different clinicians on the patient pathway understanding each other's risks. I mean, clearly when you've got a, a GP and a chest investigation, it's an x-ray, you know, they're carrying that risk because they're seeing the next person on the pathway. And that could you, and then once it goes to physiotherapist, they're carrying a piece of risk you know, passed on to maybe a physical surgeon or an intervention. So it's this idea of how the risk is shared and you actually carry it on the pathway. And this is the point about how you're going to commission and pay for the services to go forward is really important. <coughs> maybe like taking a true population health management approach and commissioning the entire pathway as a block with everybody taking part of the accountability responsibility for the money spent. So the money spent was actually needed, some of the money can say so at the right place, right time, to make sure that the money's being spent exactly along the pathway, we get the most value for it. Good point. <coughs> any, other, any other contributions at this stage? Um, so, Stacey, thank you. And Nigel is the SRO for the SMSK Pathway Redesign work and all of its parts. Some really powerful messages for you and your team, your teams, if I can put it like that, working on this. Uh, because this is, I mean, I mean MSK, you, the board, many, many board members will remember, is one of our big six ticket items. And given its implications for the development of other pathways, I wonder when we might receive a report, a paper from you guys that says, this is what we plan to do from this date, and these are the benefits that we propose to accrue, and this is how we're going to evaluate it. When do you think we might be in a position to receive more from you about that? Um, where are we now? Yeah, September. November. We're almost there with, with that work, with some support um, externally to pull that together. Well, let's, let's, let's log it provisionally for November. <coughs> It'd be really good to see this happen quickly, for all kinds of reasons, not least of all, um, to try and respond to Anne-Marie's concern. It would be yep. fantastic if we could uh, deal with that. Um, that's, that's great. Thank you very much indeed, Stacey. Thank you, Neil. And thank you, everybody, for your contributions. Neil, if I may, just, Sorry, just, Karen, just, yeah. just to help that sort of journey, um, you'll be aware of, I think, week after next, you're having a board-to-board -board with us. On the agenda for that board is an update on that, so we'll be able to sort of bring a bit more information to the ICS board. Well, that would that, be helpful. Of course, at that board to board, we won't have the panoply of no, people no, around this no, table no. there. There probably isn't a venue big enough in Oswald Street <laughs> to enable that to happen. To build one. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be good to touch base on this issue at that meeting Absolutely. for those yeah. of us from yeah, the board who were there, yeah. and then come back in November for, yeah. for a broader discussion. Excellent. Uh, Thank you. Uh, no, Neil, if I might, just a quick point on it. Uh, 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 I think it was a very interesting story, and also. You know, thanks to, to Stacey for being <laughs> putting it out there because you know owning up to where things have gone wrong sometimes is, is, is hard. Um, but having heard, and then we all know that could be repeated in many other um, specialisms. So I, 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 what I'd like to do is, is make sure that the lessons we learn from that are actually shared um, a, a, a more widely because it isn't just MSK; it that's, could be that's exactly ophthalmology, it could be you know anything. I think it's really important that we. Yeah, that we that's, share the learning and share really best practice. Thank you very much indeed. Chair, may I just add one point to that? Further on to that point, I think any future work or transformation, the processes to be followed should be patient focused. It's the patient journey focus that will eliminate duplication. Yeah, yeah Chair, Chairs and Chief Execs had lunch together before this meeting. We were talking about transformation and we were, we were debating about how to make sure that transformation <coughs> programmes, clinical pathway redesign, have clinicians at their heart, and we've heard a lot this afternoon to remind us of locating patients within that, uh, this, making sure that patients are located within that discussion as well. Roger, I can barely see your hand, but Simon says it's raised. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Oh, oh. And just a question. So there's a lot of people. The question about communication of waiting time for patients, this has been raised during the discussion. And what action can we take away from this meeting about improving communication for on waiting time for patients? Thank you. 
Simon, do you have any thoughts about that? Julian, can I, can I, just, I just want to build on that and say that we need to know waiting times for all different elements of the pathway. Yeah. One of the things I've got just in front of me is an email which we've not had updated since July, which is from SATH, which is saying the waiting time for a routine x-ray to get the report back is 31 weeks. So if I was to refer you today for an x-ray on your knee, it takes 31 weeks until I get the report back. Obviously, I mean, the other thing, obviously, about MSK pathways is you don't need x-rays to diagnose osteoarthritis. You can refer people without the x-rays. But I think we've got some of our fundamental things that we need to practice a safe system aren't working in the system. And one of the things, you know, when, and patients, you know, we have patients coming back. There's a patient that I saw the other day who was very upset. They hadn't heard back from their urgent CT scan results. And I said, well, it's because it takes, you know, 8 to 12 weeks to report. And they said, well, they told me to get to my GP in two weeks to see if the report was here. And I think, well, actually, we need, everyone in the system needs to know what the weights are. We need to be open about the weights. And, and I'm prepared to defend those weights on the back of the pressures we've had in the financial restrictions. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to be clear that these are what the weights are and be open across the whole system. Yeah, the, 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 you, you, you link the two points together very neatly, if I may say. So the, the question of providing information but also the question about some aspects of our diagnostic infrastructure, for understandable reasons, are not quite by any means where they ought to be, and that's something that requires focus and attention as well. And Nigel, did you want to respond to both or either of those points? I, I, I think I'm, I'm fully aware, because we've had a, uh, a programme of sending information out to general practice for some time, certainly over the last 18 months or so. And it, 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 is, it sounds like, from, from colleagues, uh, feedback there that that hasn't been, and, and I'm perhaps only speaking on behalf of SAS, so we just we need to work together, together obviously, as providers. Um, so we, we just need to pick that up. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to work with colleagues to make sure that we just check and, and perhaps make sure that, that that is just picked up again. I think the challenge is, and, 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 and everyone will know this, that some of our systems don't necessarily, some of that is quite a manual trawl, so therefore the frequency with, with chat information. We, we had a really good dialogue with the with representatives of general practice, including practice managers, about what sensible frequency with that uh, is. Because actually updating every every couple of days is also not awfully helpful for, for general practice. You just need to have a, a reasonable view of where that is on a you know, every fortnight or, or, or even a monthly basis because it's not going to change massively. So um, that process was there. We'll just pick it up again, Chair, and just make sure we coordinate. Thank you, and, I, and I, I just don't want to lose the, the waiting time for some diagnostic tests and results. Um, the, the, the routine imaging waiting time, I picked up in a meeting with some clinicians elsewhere recently, and that's a source of considerable concern, which I know people within South are aware of. And, I, and I'm not looking for a response today, but it would be useful just to get maybe a note to give us some advice about how we think we can tackle that going forward. Katrina? Um, are we making enough use across the system of life band care, number one, which does have all the waiting times? Two, I noticed that radiology is not included in life band care, as well as the waiting time um, information elements, data sets. Is there, you know, is there an opportunity to influence that, or is it so central we can't? So that's uh, the other question that we'd be asking. And the third question is, um, in related to my plan care, which I think is a valuable resource for patients, is are we confident that the data within them are accurate enough that we would then recommend them to patients across our patch as a source by which they can gain information regarding the symptoms? So those are my three questions. Thank you. Can I just be clear, Simon, who um, within our um, system holds the job card for enhancing, developing, taking forward communications issues like the one we've just been talking about? Uh, so I think there is, let me come back to that question, Chair, I think there's three strands. Uh, uh, but that, in terms of that question, providers have responsibility for communicating where they're up to in terms of their own waiting times and positions. And mm -hmm. uh, Katrina, uh, as appropriately said, my planned care has an update across specialty, specialty by specialty. Uh, uh, by provider organisation that you can drill down in and, and look in terms of that. Uh, I think my three strands, uh, though, that I was going to come back to anyway, are uh, the first one is uh, there's how do we communicate to our clinical community? Uh, and so how do we make sure general practice is aware in the same way as how do we make sure colleagues and other providers are aware of uh, what, what 
delays are or what waiting times are. Uh, there's the patient conversation and the patient update that Roger's talked about and asked a very specific question. Uh, Nigel, Stacey, Patricia will have a view on uh, that in terms of how we articulate that from a provider perspective, but how do we make sure we're consistent about that? I think the third element is there's a risk that we end up then looking at those things that we can count easily and you miss a number of services. So mental health waiting times run the risk then of being silent. Some of our community services run the risk of being silent because it's not as easy to count and the systems aren't there in the same pace. So, so I think there's also something for us to look at in terms of making sure we don't just have hidden waiting lists and hidden delays that aren't visible, that because we don't count them in the same way or because they're not on a system that gets recorded as a target, actually we are silent on because we've got a collective responsibility to make sure we're looking across the board on all of those elements. <coughs> Just quickly to come back on that, Simon, I don't know whether you guys are aware, recent NHS England report or from somewhere else, uh, we've gone back eight years with our diabetes outcomes in, in the UK, uh, particularly in England. People's legs are falling off and they're going blind. It's because the focus has been on elective care and it, on the elective recovery and restoration, chronic disease mm -hmm. management has fallen off. Uh, fallen off the, uh, the, and so my, my question back in this story, what made, was just thinking about this, I think we should use this as a, a, a the story and the actions we're going to be taking as the resilience that the healthcare system, a marker of resilience within the healthcare system. We've had one pandemic, it's not over yet, and we're going to get more. It's really definitely not over yet. There's going to be more coming, and when that comes, do we know how resilient our healthcare system is? This is the marker of this, and that's what we're seeing, and patients are suffering as a result. So I guess uh, the question for me, Simon, and you're spot on, in you know, how we actually, we can take one pathway and get fixated there, but I think it's about the whole thing. That's why I keep going back to population health management, the capitated budget. How are we going to manage that? A care and case manage everything that we're talking about, not just one thing. And, and sorry, Chair, the, the final bit for me is, that's not just about the NHS though, because we need to be looking at what our population challenges are. Uh, so that, you know, for a local authority, voluntary community sector, it's much broader than just a, we can count an elective waiting list or a diagnostic waiting list because we've got system <coughs> counts. Actually, well, what's the backlog that's in our population uh, that isn't on a waiting list? And what are we doing in terms of accessing that and dealing with that in a different way? Because that will get us to a sustainable health and care system beyond the reactive nature of uh, responding to things that we can count. Good discussion, um, but, but, but I'm afraid we, we need to move on. Um, I wonder if... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Meredith. Just very quickly, I just wanted to reflect back that in the last five minutes we've had a very, very good set of questions. So um, you've come up with three or four there, and this you've asked lots of questions. And we, we're really good at saying, and how about this, and what about this? Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, we are effectively... Uh, being the public in this meeting, we're asking questions of the board, but regrettably we're not coming up with very many answers, and I just wonder if we might set these questions out in, in, a, in an action log to say, let's have some answers to those questions. Meredith, you take the words from my mouth. In my, my, my summarising, I was going to make the following points. Um, one is we've agreed we'll get a, an update um, in November about the MSK pathway redesign work, the MSK work from Stacey and from Nigel. Um, that, that debate has led us into this question of communication um, to patients about waiting times, etc. I'm not going to dissect the different elements of that in this summary, but I think it would be really helpful, important for us to be able to circulate something, if for nothing else, just for information, but let's have a look at it, about what we think we ought to be doing there. And the third point I wanted to make um, is this, this, this concern about diagnostic waiting times in the kind of areas which don't normally feature on the radar of, of national regional performance management. It would be helpful to get some kind of analysis about that and the kind of actions Nigel, you and your colleagues think we need to take collectively to see how we can improve those. That won't be easy. I accept that. And I can, I can predict that a big rate limiter will be um, clinical staff availability apart from anything else, but let, it, let, let us at least understand the scale of the problem and the kind of ideas that exist for tackling that. <coughs> Meredith, it seems to me if we can get a report back at the November meeting, which is our next meeting in public, on those three things, then we'll have done Anne-Marie's story justice. Do you, are you happy with that? And um, can we thank Anne-Marie for her contribution, and could we ask her if she's sufficiently interested 
uh, to join uh, one or other of our groups to help us work through this to try and deal with the problems that she's uh, shared with us today. Thank you very much indeed. Moving on. Um, Simon, your update is packed <coughs> with lots of information. Um, I'm going to hand over to you and ask you to take us through. Uh, thanks, Chair. And I'm working on the principle that the paper's been read, so don't intend to present it uh, section by section. Uh, as per previous uh, papers, split into two parts. Uh, general update in terms of uh, things happening in the system, and then more specific areas in part, in part B. And I recognise there are a number of supporting appendices <coughs> that go with this paper as well. At the point of writing this paper, this was before the new government uh, were in place, so it was before we'd had... Uh, the publication from our new Secretary of State uh, uh, in terms of the report, Our Plan for Patients. Uh, and Chair, you referenced that at the start, at uh, the introduction, uh, but I'll just give a brief uh, summary of that and then show you how that links through to the work that we're doing anyway. Uh, so the, the Our Plan for Patients was published last Thursday. Uh, in, main, in the main, it focuses in four areas, uh, and that's broken down as an A, B, C and D. Uh, a, in terms of ambulance handover, B, uh, in terms of uh, the backlog of care, C, in terms of care, so the social care and uh, uh, that, that community-based care, and D is uh, doctors and dentists. I think when we look at that as a system and we look at the papers that we've got today and we look at some of the conversations we're having, uh, then when we look at all of those areas, those are areas that we have in our work plan and we have uh, a focus on. But there is a piece of work now that we will be doing with chief execs and with exec teams uh, in terms of just making sure we've got clarity of our focus across uh, each of those uh, areas. Uh, and we're really clear in terms of how our current plans align and deliver that performance focus uh, uh, that is coming through from, from the new government and from the Secretary of State. I think our challenge is to make sure that uh, we deliver on the areas that have been identified as priorities, but we do that in a way that is done with our staff and with our local residents, uh, so and, and with our clinicians and with our uh, leadership teams, so that we've, we've really got a focus on improving outcomes uh, through that uh, collaboration, coordination, and reducing the duplication, uh, uh, because the more we drive for the performance management and the more we drive for the focus on delivery, we need to make sure we do that with our clinical teams and with our leadership teams uh, and not against or not to in a, in a direct way that isn't constructive or helpful. Uh, the, uh, the, the section A then updates on the, the, the number of things that are happening in our system uh, and uh, happy to pick up on any of those areas in more detail uh, but really then want to just highlight a couple of areas uh, the, the COVID-19 Autumn Booster Programme has got off to a really positive start across Shropshire, Telford and Rican, uh, but it would be remiss of me not to use this opportunity uh, to reinforce that and to push that, both in terms of uh, our organisational uh, teams, uh, as well as to patients and members of the public and partners. Uh, we're clearly working through the cohort list uh, as, as set out in the National Plan, uh, but we do want to make sure that we've got a really good uptake uh, across Shropshire, Telford and Rekin uh, and a really clear focus on that. But equally, I want to just thank colleagues uh, who are part of delivering that programme. Uh, they, they've really organised, really well structured uh, and delivering uh, at present in advance of our trajectory, in advance of our targets and really important that we maintain that uh, and continue to deliver that. Uh, the second element that I just want to pick up on really quickly is recognise the pressure that our system's currently under in terms of urgent and emergency care. Uh, and, and, and make sure that we just recognise the work that, again, our teams are doing across the system to respond to that pressure. Uh, and, and I'm not just talking there about staff in the emergency department, although that's important, but I'm talking about the pressure that's in community, general practice, uh, uh, across the board in terms of uh, mental health services, children's services, uh, there is significant demand being placed on current health and care services, and I don't mean to offend anybody if I've missed anybody in that list. It's meant, not meant to be an exclusive list. Uh, uh, but uh, I just want to, to thank publicly in the board meeting, uh, Chair, uh, our staff in terms of the, the work that they are currently delivering and the challenges they are facing. Uh, finally, then, it, it was the second part of the paper that focuses on a couple of key areas. Uh, we need to establish the Integrated Care Partnership. Uh, uh, which is that overarching board uh, that exists uh, in the new legislation uh, and we want to do that in a way that's about building on the really good work of the two health and wellbeing boards 
uh, that builds on uh, the joint strategic needs assessments that already exists in our organisation. And that integrated care partnership has one main task, uh, and that's to deliver uh, an integration strategy. Now, I think, uh, and uh, Chief Exec has been having this conversation uh, over the past couple of months, uh, this is not a whole new document on a blank sheet of paper. This is building on the work that uh, this system's done previously, but it is about bringing it together in a way, in one place, where we can articulate what do we mean by integration for the residents of Shropshire, Telford and Rickin? How do we make sure we move this from being a NHS conversation into a uh, resident-based conversation that's based on communities and based around people? Uh, rather than uh, what do our NHS structures look like uh, and I'm you know, really pleased with the support we get from both of our local authorities in that space and in that regard and for both of our health and wellbeing boards uh, in that regard as well. Uh, but we've got some deadlines that we need to get into and we need to deliver against. Uh, our draft strategy needs to be produced by December uh, and we need to make sure that we've taken that through the right governance routes to get to that uh, end point. Uh, the other aspect then that I would just want to flag, uh, and this is in the appendix, is the Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, we need to ratify that as a board today. Uh, happy to take questions and comments on that when I get to the end. Uh, our view here is this just sets a line of sight between NHS England and the Integrated Care Board. Uh, the MOU speaks for itself, uh, and I think it, it's the system-first approach of having a single line of sight into the system that you referenced at the, at the beginning. Uh, the uh, healthcare, uh, the hospitals transformation program. Uh, I would always want to call it the health and care transformation program because I think it's much broader than just the hospital uh, piece. But I recognise it's uh, it's about the hospital uh, element. Uh, the, the strategic outline case received approval, uh, which is positive. I think let's recognise uh, that there will be some some nervousness and some concern in some partners uh, and some parties around actually what does it mean now in terms of the detail. Uh, and how does that get taken forward and I think we've got a collective responsibility to be able to articulate the really strong integrated out of hospital care uh, and the delivery of that that will enable us then to say uh, how do we right size and fit the uh, secondary care services for our population to plug into that in the right way. Uh, I think it would be wrong of us to look at this as a single solution that's you know, we do something from an estate's point of view and that solves all the system's problems. Uh, let's really focus on integrated out-of-hospital care and then make sure we get the right services in the right place in terms of uh, secondary care. But it's a really important step in the process of getting the strategic outline case uh, approved. Uh, the final point then for me to particularly pull out is uh, the NHS has an oversight framework. Uh, and that oversight framework sets uh, criteria uh, where each of our statutory organisations and the Integrated Care Board uh, are, are scored against a number of different uh, criteria. Uh, the Integrated Care Board was, ta was tasked with working with our providers uh, to do an assessment of those uh, uh, oversight framework uh, ratings uh, and to make a submission to NHS England in terms of our recommendations around where we felt our organisations uh, should be. Uh, we adopted, uh, with Chief Exec and uh, Board Agreement, a, a partnership approach. So this was not done uh, through a, a small team sitting in a darkened room coming up with an outcome and saying, we think the answer is X. This was done by uh, asking a self-assessment process to be led by chief execs and chairs uh, in statutory organisations, uh, for that to be taken through their own governance routes, uh, and for that to come back then uh, into the chief execs uh, uh, meeting so that it can come through and be published here uh, as you see it in, in our report. Uh, I'd be grateful for Chief Exec comments at some point, should you uh, invite them, Chair, but I think the process was a really positive one uh, in terms of the, the way we set that out, but the outcomes of that can be seen in the report uh, and we need to ratify those uh, so that we can make that submission formally to NHS England. Uh, I will pause uh, there. There are other bits in the report. I'm happy to pull out any questions uh, uh, that people want to ask. There's a lot in there, Simon. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to hand the floor over to you people uh, with any questions or comments you want to raise. Roger. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Um, I'm conscious of feedback, so I'll talk slowly. <laughs> um, 
first of all, Simon, thank you for your report. Just a couple of questions. Can you give us some sort of critical path on the production of the strategy in terms of our involvement in the board? And secondly, you mentioned the HDP Suicide Protocol. And I really want to support your move to try and get that integrated with the community transformation plan as well. Because I think it's hugely important for our stakeholders to understand how these two pieces of equipment can be fitted together. And I think there's an issue about communication and getting the, the message across to our communities and our patients about how this needs to go forward together and not in, in, in a, a separate manner. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> two important questions there. In terms of the first one, in terms of the critical uh, path, uh, then I would expect a, a, an outline to come to the informal board in October uh, uh, so that we've got some opportunity to have a conversation there. Uh, and, and when I mean outline, I'm not expecting it to be written by that point, Roger, so just to manage expectations, but uh, an outline of the areas that we would want to cover. Uh, I, I would also just reference there that actually I think part of bringing the outline starts to answer your second question as well then. Uh, because I think we've got two large-scale change programmes uh, in our system that, uh, that link together. Uh, and, and actually, if we don't deliver in a really comprehensive way uh, the local care programme, which is the integrated community-based piece of work, and let's be really clear, that's much more than just what do we do with general practice and community services, because that gets us into how do we work with our communities, how do we work with local residents, where's our community resilience come from, uh, uh, what does our population health data tell us about the ageing needs of our population? I'm looking at my two local authority chief exec colleagues, that's why I was looking to the right at that point. Uh, 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 we don't get that bit right, then anything we do building-wise around a hospital uh, will, will not enable that to be fit for purpose to meet uh, the, the, the needs of our local population. Uh, so, so we've got to really be clear uh, that getting that community-based approach right then drives the... Uh, what's our needs for our population and how do we right size uh, the model of care for secondary care in a way then that enables that to get, get taken forward and that's the conversation uh, Nigel we've been having as, uh, Nigel's the SRO uh, for the hospital transformation program and Patricia in terms of the local care program uh, and, and getting that communication piece right I think is a really important point because uh, we need to be able to articulate uh, the, the st both the stages we'll go through with the local residents in terms of that development, as well as articulate uh, and, and take on board their views on how we develop uh, the solutions and do this in that co-production way. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, Meredith. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Uh, a couple of points, uh, really uh, uh, both around the certainty that we have built into ensuring that our population are informing two key pieces of work. Uh, so one is the in integrated care strategy and I, I note the, the, the deadline. Uh, I just wanted to get some reassurance uh, and assurance if available that uh, the population are going to be part of the process of building up that strategy rather than us coming up with something and then presenting it as if uh, we've pulled it out of a hat. Um, and the second area um, is referred to in your report, but I couldn't see any uh, background on it, and that is the, uh, an update on the Shrewsbury Health and Wellbeing Hub, and specifically um, clarity around uh, ongoing consultation on that. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, on the first question uh, <coughs> in terms of the population involvement in terms of the development of the integration care strategy, I do want to just set some context around uh, what will get produced for December as a first draft. The expectation nationally is uh, that that will be the pulling together of the plans that we've already got in place rather than a full public consultation to get to a point of developing uh, the strategy. Uh, so it's an evolution of what we have to refine that rather than, than starting from a new piece. Uh, however, what we've then got an opportunity to do is before the final version is published, which is uh, in 2023, I think then we have to then make sure that we develop the final version in a way that uh, fully engages uh, with our local communities in a way to make that meaningful uh, and to take that forward. So, so I think there's probably two stages to it, Meredith, and I, I just want to manage that in terms of the December deadline versus the 
version that we'll need to publish in, in 2023. Uh, in so terms I'm of... Just saying, sorry. 2023 20, is 12 months. Are we talking the first, uh, the third, or, or, or where, roughly where is that going to be? It's a civil service year, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be in one of the seasons. Uh, 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 within. Well, each uh, season six months long, so that doesn't help. <laughs> either, so. Uh, so can I come back to you? Because I'll just, I don't want to... I've not got the guidance and the deadline in front of me, so I don't want okay. to give a, an incorrect... Uh, that date in public and set expectations uh, that will cause an issue. Equally, I could have gone the other way and said it will be December 2023 and cover all options, but I'd prefer to come back with the correct answer rather than, than one that I've just decided on, uh, Meredith, if that's okay with you. So we'll pick that up as an action and we'll circulate that, not wait until the next board uh, in terms of doing that. In terms of the second piece, uh, I'm going to hand to Gareth, if that's okay, so he can update on the, uh, on the, on the hub. But, but just before Gareth comes in, I just want to be really clear on this. Uh, and it's a really important opportunity to get a, 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 a consistent message across. Uh, we need to make sure that we're doing everything in our gift uh, to support general practice to be, and I mean general practice here, not primary care, to be sustainable and to deliver high quality services. Uh, and indeed, it's one of the Secretary of State's priorities in terms of uh, the doctor piece that she talks about in, in the D. Uh, uh, the Shrewsbury Hub is not about merging practices. It's not about... Uh, 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 taking patients' choice away and residents' choice away in terms of uh, their ability to, to choose a general practice or to access general practice. It's about how do we find ways to make current uh, buildings and estate that's not fit for purpose and how do we get external investment into this system to allow us to really start to say uh, uh, and build and develop the general practice that we want for our local communities and for our local population. So, so we need to get it right, and we need to do that in the right way, and we need to follow the process. But let's be really clear, uh, we will be driving, and I will be relentless in saying, how do we continue to support general practice to be sustainable to meet the needs of our population going forwards in fit-for-purpose premises that we can deliver a modern-day general practice from uh, in a way that, that allows us to build that community approach? Uh, Gareth. Yeah, so without echoing um, what Simon's just said, um, I think the end of, the con of your question referred to the consultation, so I suspect what's behind that is the, the engagement and communication process we're, we're working through. Um, regardless of how well we think that's carried out, there's very clearly some concern within um, our, our population and citizens around the process that we're going through. Um, those focus on the process of engagement, um, the actual location that has been identified as the preferred location, preferred location, not the actual location, um, and then the transport issues that relate to that. Off the back of that, we've reopened the options appraisal process. So um, colleagues may be aware that there were nine options that were originally reviewed, taking that forward into a preferred option. But off the back of the concerns that have been raised, we've reopened that and that work is currently underway. Um, that will then allow us to uh, uh, ensure that the, the best location is, is carried forward. And when we get to that point, reassess the transport issues that are related to that. The consultation... Um, is a really important aspect of that. We've been doing the informal consultation engagement to date. The formal consultation will come when we get to a point of um, a, a clear option that can be carried forward, and that will come at some point in the future. It was scheduled for October, and it has been partially delayed, or it's been delayed partially uh, because of the uh, reopening of the options appraisal. Um, in terms of specific touch points with our, pay, uh, with our citizens, I've got a town council meeting uh, early next week, and crucially a stakeholder reference group, which is representatives from practices, local councils, um, and other uh, interest groups who will contribute to the development of the options appraisal going, going forwards. So I think there are things that we could have done differently historically to give our population confidence that the engagement's been robust. Um, but I think we've heard that and we're making a different approach going forwards. Brilliant, thank you, and that, that's great. And uh, thanks, Simon, for, for the detail there. Uh, and just to be clear, my question was specifically around consultation because that, yes. that's the bit that uh, uh, is a little bit hazy sometime in the future. And I'd just like to see some, some specific plans around that once it's in a position to, uh, to get rolling. If I may, Simon. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the only reason why there's, um, there was a sp specific uh, plan to commence in October and a formal consultation. But because of the reopening of the options appraisal, that's going to be delayed by a period of a small number of months. But until the options appraisal is completed, we can't be clear on when that options, uh, when that formal consultation will start. Um, but we shall have a view on that very quickly. Julian? Uh, just a quick point about the health and wellbeing hub. That, uh, as the primary care member for Shropshire, I'd be quite happy to be involved in the process. Thank you. Call the executive team and the communications team um, as needed. 
that would be very helpful. Yes. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, David Sidaway? Thank you, Trina. Sorry? Katrina. I'm sorry. Katrina, then um, David, and then Niti. Very quick point. Uh, with regards to um, strategy, just to remind us that we have got to include the five-year strategy plus elements of the ten-year strategy in the OBC. So when we're looking at the strategy timelines, can we also look at the OBC timelines? Yeah, it, uh, thank, thank you for that. I wanted to raise a question about making sure this board has a clear line of sight on the governance arrangements for HTP and, and the timelines for the delivery of the OBC. I'm sure that's all in hand somewhere, um, but it would be useful for me at least, and maybe for the, the whole of the board just to have a note about that so we're all clear. Could we organise that? Now? Yeah, I'm happy to take that action. Yeah. We, we have been briefing through a range of different uh, media. Um, we've got a range of different stakeholder yeah. uh, briefings we've got, and we've also got particularly the HTP Programme Board, of which ICS, uh, Community Trust sure. and others are specific. I was thinking involved. about this board as a, a corporate yeah. entity, just having sight of that. I mean, the responsibility for the delivery of the outline business case rests with SAF. Yeah. But it's a, yes, yes. it's a system-wide exercise. We all have to play a part in it. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely That'd be good. Thank you. David Sidaway. Thank you. Just three quick points uh, to the earlier point around the uh, integrated strategy. Uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board in Telford Marine Kim is looking at the emerging JSNA tomorrow, which will be developed in that revision associated with that health and wellbeing strategy will inform the integrated strategy, so that's on its way. The second point is around page 51 of our document, uh, of our pack, uh, in relation to HTP. Just to be clear, from a, a member of the board perspective, which I am, um, and also, as the Chief Executive of Elfton Reekin, we remain opposed to HTP, so I'd like that recorded, because of the comms that went out recently, um, talks about uh, the uh, ICS being, um, the way it re read, it was uh, unanimous in terms of its support, it is not, so I want that recorded, that Elfton Reekin remain opposed to HTP. And the final point is around the elective hub, again on page 51, It'd be helpful to understand, maybe outside this meeting, um, how the residents will benefit from that uh, £10 million investment. It clearly indicates the when, the first phase, which is mid-23. So what difference will that make to our residents, both in Shropshire and Telfton region, would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And apologies if that um, comment about HTPs caused any embarrassment at all was not intended. Um, Actually, you've just triggered another thought in my mind. When is the first meeting of the Integrated Care Partnership? Have we got a date? Yes, we, we talk about the end of September, which is Friday. As far as I know, there isn't a meeting <laughs> we had a date. before the end of Friday. A date was agreed. So through you, Chair, there was a date was agreed. For whatever reason, that didn't quite get over the line, but... The, uh, there are people frantically working on uh, resolving the first week in October or, or absolutely the second week to have the first meeting, so they're, they're on it. I've just, yeah. checked, I've just checked in again. They haven't quite nailed down a date. Because the I thought just, it did occur to me, if we talk about timelines for the development of the integrated care strategy, it presupposes that we can get ourselves organised to hold the first meeting of the integrated care partnership before then. So that, it's good to know that's in hand. Thank you. Um, I think, Niti, you were next. Possibly, but I'm happy to wait for others if somebody else wants to have a good Just two things. I just wanted some clarification if Health Watches will be invited to that first meeting of the ICP. Um, the other question, well, it was a comment really, following on from the discussion around the Health and Wellbeing Hub, I just wanted it noted that Health Watch Shropshire had been raising concerns around the level of comms and engagement around that hub right from the very beginning and I was concerned that we weren't invited to that first reference group meeting and I had to chase to be able to go to the second um, so I just wanted the, the um, board to be aware of that. Thank you. We will make sure that amends are made for that omission. Thank you. Um, so on the strategy Simon, just, just a question as we're developing the strategy. Uh, two things come to mind, and I'd just love to get a view on that, maybe at later dates, so maybe not for detailed discussion, is data and digital. Where does that sit within the strategy, and who's looking at it? Because population health management is not going to happen if you don't do that. Uh, two, I was really interested in hearing about, you know, I have to declare my interest on health and well-being hubs and such like. Uh, 
as I'm working with the National NHS England Clavel site programme. But my, my, my involvement is that, in that has been around how do you measure quality of life in terms of place. You know, if you're putting something in place, um, putting services together, what does it mean in terms of quality of life? Which comes back to how, what is the quality of life perceived by the consumer, the healthcare? People, people don't have to be ill to know what the quality of life if, if, if services are coming together. So the second question for me is in the strategy, how are we going to define some of the outcomes that we're going to look for in the strategy? Now, is that going to come from up on high, Simon? Is NHS England going to give us that on the key performance indicators around that? Or do we have some leeway to design something local? <coughs> Uh, uh, so, so two questions. And first one in terms of uh, uh, digital uh, and uh, and that intelligence agenda. Uh, so, uh, you know, the conversation we've been having with both local authorities is there, there isn't a solution if we've not considered the digital aspect uh, uh, to this, and that is will be part of what gets produced. I do just want to manage expectations around what gets produced for December versus the 2020 <coughs> uh, uh, piece. Uh, so that you know, that I don't want to set us up to. Uh, expect something in December that then we think uh, when it comes or when it lands it's not set the world on fire. I want to no, just it's just a place map, Simon, yeah, yeah, yeah. that I'm looking for so that at least it's in there. Yeah, yeah, and that's important and the placeholder and noted in terms of that. Uh, uh, the second piece is uh, I think we have local flexibility um, and I think if we do this the right way round actually uh, the, uh, the JSNAs uh, and the health and wellbeing uh, strategies that are already set should be the basis of mm -hmm. Uh, the outcomes that, that we put in and drive in terms of what are we doing to improve our population and then our strategy needs to say how are we going to deliver and execute uh, that and then that mm -hmm. translates into what's this board's responsibility, what's statutory board's responsibility, what's the local council's responsibility and how do all of those elements come together to deliver the integration strategy that should result in improved outcomes as per the JSNA. And obviously the financial regime, do we have any flexibility around that or is this going to be again from on high? Because I guess you know you can have the best strategy in the world to deliver outcomes and then if the financial strategy, by which I mean pooled resources, by which I mean you know everybody putting their money together into creating something of value, do we have any flexibility or is that going to be defined as well? Uh, so, so I think we've got a numbers of flexibility already anyway. I guess the challenge is, it doesn't matter how many minuses you put together, if you Correct. put putting minuses together, it'll just be a bigger minus. It doesn't necessarily exactly. uh, uh, drive uh, 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 productivity. Uh, slightly sarcastic, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but the, you know, we, we invest already in terms of the Better Care Fund, uh, and, and I think there's a commitment in terms of a formal... But not a formal a, a formal review that says how do we make sure we use that in the right way to really drive social value and we understand what that money gets spent for because that's somewhere in the region of 60 million pounds across uh, across both 63 million pounds across both local authorities uh, and and that's not about saying uh, look, let's unpick everything but it's about saying are we getting best value for that 63 million pounds what does that translate to so there's already significant sums of uh, uh, pooled resource uh, and so, you know, it's how do we build on that? And I've got, you know, really clear commitment. If, if we can demonstrate that that really starts to change the dials on a number of our outcomes, then why would we not do more in that regard? Because that's, that's already a gift in our flexibility. We don't need national permission to do any more with that. We've already got that permission in place anyway. As long as they don't stop us, that's the other thing. I think they're more likely to stop us on saying where are we at financially uh, as, a, as a system now and what does that mean in terms of us getting control rather than uh, actually our ability to be innovative and, and use our resource in a different way. Thank you. Look, I'm very clear about this. If, 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 unless we seize the opportunity to devise our own view of outcomes and unless we seize the opportunity to apply our, 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 our our freedom, actually, to be as flexible as we like in terms of the financial regime. There are constraints, and it'll be a question of risk for us and for NHS England. Unless we take those opportunities, there's little point in us being an ICS board. The whole purpose of this kind of exercise is to give local determination based on an assessment of local needs and a view about local outcomes. Now, there'll be some that we'd be required to deliver. But beyond that, so long as we've got the headroom, to develop and think about them and operate uh, for their delivery, then that's exactly what we ought to do. I think if, taking time as point about expectations, if we get to a point um, at the end of December with a draft of the integrated care strategy 
and it's just a rehash of national requirements, well, frankly, it won't be much good. I think we'd all agree with that, wouldn't we? So, um, again, good discussion. Um, I, I'm conscious of time, and Simon, did... Sorry, Julian and Terry. Can I just ask a, a question around the MOU and also the National Oversight Framework and the exit criteria? It requires a deep dive into the appendices which made me splutter over my coffee on Sunday morning. On page 22 it talks about the uh, oversight framework and it, the bit that made me splutter was the bit where it said the historic leadership and government competency concerns and I thought that might be me. But it talks about the, the, five, strat the five elements that are needed, one of which is the agreed five-year STW integrated system improvement plan. And in the MOU it talks about having the final draft signed off by the 31st of August. And then the question is then leading on to the, the second um, paper in the appendices around the National Oversight Framework. It details the five points and then breaks them down with about 30 different targets. So I was wondering, I may have missed it, I may have been asleep, but are we getting, as the board, would we expect to see a report that comes back with a RAG rating and a progress assessment against those exit <coughs> criteria? So I'm not necessarily to answer any of the detail today, but yeah. it's more about oh, have we got that, that sort of integrated system improvement plan that's signed off with Engines England? And are we going to have some sort of report? Uh, uh, okay, so so uh, really, uh, absolutely appropriate question, uh, Julian, and that's the full intention. So uh, what what we'd realised and where we've worked on is the system has had draft exit criteria for a while, and then not then said, and what's the underpinning information that's going to move us from move us out of uh, level four. Uh, and so actually, if we're not careful, it becomes a never-ending cycle that you can't break. Uh, so part of the document that's in the appendices starts to say, actually, we've got an aspiration uh, to be uh, much better than, uh, uh, than, than for a level four rating, uh, but we've got to then get out of that cycle. So how are we going to demonstrate that and how do we uh, prove that? And that starts to be the draft uh, metrics that are in there. And I would fully expect in the performance report and in the updates, the RAG rating that sits against that uh, not potentially every board in terms of all of the areas, but the progress that shows how do we do that. The other piece we're having is the conversation with NHS England to say, uh, we, I don't want to have, I don't want to set up a whole piece of governance around managing uh, the metrics of the exit criteria. Uh, if this is meaningful, this has to sit as part of our core work and it has to align to the way that we're working as a system anyway, and it's built into mm -hmm. our business as usual, and we're able to demonstrate our evidence against that. Uh, rather than, here's a whole set of additional meetings that look at specific metrics without being connected to what are we doing with our providers, what we're doing with the local community, what we're doing with our local authorities. Uh, so we're working with NHS England to make sure that we connect those elements. Uh, uh, but it was absolutely appropriate the board sees the draft criteria as that's developed and gets the opportunity to be, to make, for that to be visible uh, so that then as we start to then bring the reporting through and we start to tie this down, we get this to a point that's understood and we can articulate Please, can we avoid setting up another detailed, parallel, sometimes competing performance management system with loads of data um, and RAG rates? Let's, let's focus on the real essential priorities and let the rest take care of itself. I think, I think that's a really important point. I mean, you know my view about the MOU, etc. Um, it it's hardly fills my heart with joy and leads me to think it's going to lead us to the sunny uplands of success. But there are some things that need to be articulated, it's there. How we manage it, how we use that kind of thing is, is very much for us to think about carefully in, in a minimalist way, enabling us to fulfil our responsibilities but also produce something that's meaningful for the board. Terry. Just quickly for me, um, just on uh, picking up Lynn's Health Watch comments, I'm not sure we were invited to the ICP either, so for the record. I, I mean, I, I think as David's pushed out, I, I don't think there's a... So the date that's set that's been cancelled, there wasn't a full invite that went out. So uh, okay. let's, we're in the process of setting the date and agreeing how that gets taken forward. Understood. But again, I think it's fair to say, isn't it, David, that, that the, the core membership, if I can put it like that, for the ICP might be fairly tight in the first instance with a view to that developing in time. Am I, I right about that? we've taken, yeah. yeah. So, so if people are disappointed that they've not been invited, invited to the first meeting, I accept a commitment from me that there will be a means of making sure that other partners are engaged and given an opportunity to influence the way in which the discussions go. 
and just finally, I'm not entirely sure if I can speak with confidence that the entire entirety of the voluntary community sector support the HTP either, just for the record. Okay. Uh, it would be surprising if that were the case. Uh, Last yeah. word and then I'm going to move us on. Um, the reason that we both raised it is because it, it's referenced on page four of the report about us being part of that meeting. That's why we've mentioned it. We, we'll tidy that up. We'll, be, we'll, we'll give you clarity about how that's meant to be taken forward. Okay, so Simon, are we done with your report? Is there anything we need to formally adopt or approve or agree? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I was on that page. Uh, so uh, uh, ratification of the MOU by the board. Oh, joy. Yeah. Ratified. <laughs> uh, and approval of the provider uh, oversight framework ratings uh, as included and as talked about. Everybody happy with that? Okay, good. Thanks, Simon. That's great. great. Moving on, um, item 21, ICB delegation to sign off the SAS submission. I didn't know whether that meant a lot of us as a delegation or whether we were to be delegated the responsibility to sign it off. But, but Vanessa Watley, you will explain all to us. Over to you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so, fairly brief paper, really. Um, there's some information in the um, appendixes if you need them. It. Um, SAF is a member of the Clinical Medical Scheme. Um, for trust maternity incentive scheme. Um, this is a, an incentive scheme regulated by NHS resolution and supports the delivery of safe and maternity care. As part of that, um, it requires um, a sign off uh, at ICB and some data. Nick, did you want to add anything to this? Um, no, other than I've started chairing the Lake Paternity Unit System Board, and it, it feels good. It feels in a good place. It's obviously someone relatively new coming into the system with Ocda and all the maternity concerns. Um, I've just felt um, just very positive in the progress of the two meetings so far I've chaired. We've managed to rearrange things in your view of not having lots of boards and different groups pulled from each other. Alison's got here today as well as we get involved. We've got a nice, clear structure, and it feels it's making really good positive um, moves in the correct direction. And Thanks. that was also um, the feeling on this morning we had SOAG, another acronym, I'm afraid, but it's the System Oversight Group, which is looking at SAF and its position in um, special measures or soft enough for. And again, with regards to maternity issues, I think it's a positive move into the correct direction. Thank you. So well done, everybody who has contributed towards this. Saf, Nigel, comfortable with this? Yeah, I, I think that, I think the key thing, and uh, Meredith will remember at a previous um, uh, meeting of this board that we were talking about how we avoid um, <coughs> any de uh, any duplication where it's where it's appropriate, you know, where, where we can. And I think the key point is that as a trust board. Um, and uh, and the and the CNST scheme, the clinical negligence scheme for trusts. This is this is the fourth iteration of this. So we've we've been at this for for some time, obviously in a different different guise. So we are really really focused as a trust board on the scrutiny and the endorsement of this. And for example, in the board seminar, which is the first of December, we're doing that together. Um, so you know Nick will be joining us. So we're not trying to duplicate and have yet another meeting. We're trying to do it all in the same way. Um, and um, as, as Nick says, obviously the LMNS as the system uh, group is key to that. Thank you very much. Katrina? I think it's, it's important to note that the CNST has got ten elements within it. Mm -hmm. And from that point of view, it looks relatively simple. <laughs> it's not a But underneath, underneath each of those elements, there are multiple other elements, all of which have got either specific delivery dates, ongoing delivery dates, Etc. 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 With a high level of um, evidence demonstration that's required to get over the line, and that's one of the reasons that we're actually saying uh, delegation or requesting delegation as part of this process, rather than bringing it to the board, because in actual <coughs> fact we will be uh, in next email at the very last moment to get the last element signed off, because some of those elements literally will close the day before we have to submit. So it, it is not an easy programme that we could just, well, why can't we just finish it by December and bring it here? Um, so I'm very grateful for, for your um, engagement in this. And um, 
just help me, to what extent is there alignment between the Ockenden recommendations and these ten standards? Um, there is certainly uh, a lot of crosstalk between them. Mm -hmm. The Ockenden recommendations are very specific to very um, uh, you know, easily called out elements of delivery mm -hmm. of the life, so the <clears> improvements <throat> that need to be made. Um, and but if you are, if you actually mapped on um, the essence of the Ockenden requirements onto the CNST, I think you will find a lot yeah, of crosstalk. That's what I think. But they're not designed to crosstalk in that way. Um, mm. But by delivering one, you are inherently assisting the delivery of the other. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Meredith, any comments from you in terms of your subcommittee? In terms of the, the paper before, as you're comfortable with it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and just to pick up on Nigel's uh, allusion there, um, uh, Alison Bussley and I did go off and have a conversation about where all the uh, mechanisms are facing and pointing and uh, connecting and uh, are the dotted lines here and there. Uh, and in the end, we thought we can't find a gap here. Uh, so, um, so, for example, I'm, I, I now attend uh, MTAC, uh, so I'm the Chair of the Quality and Performance Committee, I now attend uh, the Internet Transformation Assurance Committee. Uh, we have LMNS and SAG reporting on the Quality and Performance Committee. What we wanted to do was make sure that we didn't create another thing that just got in the way of all the other things that already seem to be working very well. So we uh, came away feeling quite, quite sure that uh, That's good. things were in That's very helpful. The architecture was, was strong. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to move on then to the next item, which is the West Midlands ICB CEO collaboration, item 22. Simon. <coughs> and I would, uh, I'm hopeful that this isn't going to generate a massive conversation because I, I'm, I can't get massively excited about governance, but there's an important piece of governance in this uh, uh, that I need the board to be cited on so that it enables us to get on to do the work. We're aware, as the size of an ICB and ICS, uh, then. Uh, we need to collaborate and work with partners and make sure that we're doing things at the right level, at the right size, in terms of uh, uh, making things happen and move things uh, forward. Uh, the paper sets out an approach that we've been working on uh, with uh, the six other ICBs, sort of the five other ICBs uh, across the West Midlands, part of our region, uh, uh, to say how might we collaborate on a number of things and how do we work at a West Midlands level to avoid having to do everything six times separately uh, if we can avoid it. Uh, the paper sets that out, it, it includes a proposed terms of reference. The reason it comes here is because the terms of reference demonstrate a line of sight in the governance terms uh, of how that joint committee would report through to here. And so this board needs to sign off that delegation uh, to enable me to operate in that way, uh, but recognising that the ICB uh, is the statutory sovereign organisation that retains accountability, uh, but we're able to delegate some of that activity through to a shared decision making. So, question of governance, are you comfortable with this? The, the, the notion of joint committees is well known, well understood by those who've operated in CCG land for some years. I, it didn't seem to be anything extraordinary about it to me. Are you all okay with that? Harry? Uh, just, just uh, I fully support it a bit. I think collaboration is great. I, it, it just struck me, I'm looking at the list of 3.61, that there was a number of items there below like task and finish items around transfer of some functions. But there was one or two gems in there that, if prioritised, could make a difference. And I'm thinking particularly around mutual aid and epileptic care. If we could create that hub ourselves, that would be a big win. And I would just suggest it comes pretty quickly to come to the final. Yeah, so I think that's a really fair point. And we, uh, I guess we try to be proportionate around the things that we bite off and what order we do it because we think there's some things where it's been delegated to us anyway we just need to get we've got the right structures in place uh, there's some elements where we do it in a bit more ad hoc way uh, and so we can be more structured and more formalized around it and there's some things where there's an opportunity for us to really think differently about how we do it so so i guess we're sort of putting those into those three broad boxes and then saying where do we get into that space and how do we resource that in a way to enable that to happen uh, and i we don't see this as just being ICB chief execs, we see this as how do we bring providers with us into this space yeah. to start to develop some of this thinking in a different way. Um, Patricia? Sort of leading on from that, not just in terms of mutual aid, but to make sure that we're representing our residents. We don't provide the majority of tertiary care, you know, notwithstanding Robert Jones is a tertiary provider uh, for orthopaedics, but things like big cancers, etc., completely dependent yes. on big centres. So that's important, is making sure that our 
residents uh, and population are represented in terms of wait times uh, and getting access to those services um, and that they're valued for money. Uh, I think the second point is a big issue around workforce. Most of the big training centres sit outside of our ICB. Uh, we need to make sure that we're getting the right, the right uh, level of juniors, training uh, placements, etc., here, and that we have a very clear that we're not undermining each other in terms of people who are qualifying and wanting to work at the big shiny centre in Birmingham and Wolverhampton. Actually, we've got a lot to offer here. So, you know, in terms of that workforce pool and that um, pipeline of workforce from a health perspective, it's really important that we we influence too. Uh, and, and sorry, Chair, and the, the, the bit that this does is put us as an ICB on an equal footing with all the other ICBs, irrespective of size, to be able to get Correct. into that conversation yeah. at the right way at the right time. So I was keen that we were part of this and start to shape and develop this. Just a, just a couple of points. Well, a point and a question, really. The point is, when I, when I looked at the areas of potential collaboration, I take the point, Harry, that you've made, and I think they're very, very relevant. I wondered whether it was radical enough, whether it was adventurous enough. It looked to me a bit like, well, we've heard this kind of thing before. I don't, I don't mean that to be disparaging. But given all that we're trying to achieve, and every uh, ICS, big or small, is facing the same kind of challenges, I just wondered whether this board would like to um, ask the, the collaboration to be even more adventurous and radical in terms of the areas of prioritisation as you, of, of, of action as you think about priorities. Uh, so I think that's probably fair, Chair. I think our view was we need to get something established, uh, we need to get it in place and we need to get it off the ground and we need to find a way of working together uh, in, a, in a sensible and pragmatic way. As I explained to, in response to Harry's question, I think we have got the three strands uh, and I think the three strands will be let's do what we've actually got to do now in terms of some of that delegation of specialised commissioning uh, uh, and, you know, 999, we do that already, but let's be, we get that on a really consistent footing. I think that the elements of areas for development can be as ambitious as we want, but we need to make sure we can put the capacity in to deliver on them and it not just become another talking shop, shop at a regional level. Okay, so um, what, what basis will we use to judge success of this collaboration? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think we've touched on some of it actually. Uh, so uh, if we start to develop some of the response to either the workforce challenges um, or some of our provider development uh, in a way that gets us to be working differently with uh, uh, West Midlands regional colleagues uh, and, and we see that benefiting and articulated in our system, then I think that will be uh, an element uh, of success that the board can use to judge that. Uh, the other aspects will be actually just having really good governance in place in terms of some of the things that are being passed to ICBs and us discharging that without us having to have our running cost all to do that six times separately. Um, it would be interesting to see how that develops, but thank you. And, uh, and I think you? another key area is fragility of services. We've got some really fragile services here which could possibly be done better at scale elsewhere. Yeah, and that's the kind so of there, is, there is opportunity in terms of mutual aid, <laughs> it's mutual in terms of two way as well as that. that so, so my question is, this is a, a West Midlands ICB CEO collaboration. ICBs are about health and care. So my question is, where do local authorities sit in terms of collaboration between our local, local authorities and our local authorities involved in this discussion as well? So local authorities haven't been in this. This has been about what's been... Part of this is also, I should have said, as part of responding to the change in the operating model for NHS England and the shift in the delegation of responsibility from NHS England to ICBs about making sure we've got a, a vehicle and a mechanism of responding to that different operating model that's been put in place uh, as well. Uh, I think that we've not engaged local authorities at this point because this has been how do we take on those NHS England responsibilities and about getting this off the ground and making this happen. It's not about having ruled that out at any point but at the same time, I'm also very aware, and it's referenced in here, uh, responding to the West Midlands combined authority piece. Uh, actually, we're not in those active conversations, but it might play out into our two local authorities. I'd rather be hearing about that and know where our position is than not be involved at all. But me going to the West Midlands combined authority meetings is probably not best use of my time. Mm, I'm just wondering whether this new collaboration 
would care to invite local authority input and representation to explore the means of extending the terms of reference and the priorities for action which deal with, deal with, respond to the interface between health and social care for which ICBs have all got responsibility. You guys might not like the idea of this. <laughs> <laughs> I accept that. But we hear a lot from local government that ICBs are only about health. Not from you guys, but from others. Here's an opportunity to bake into an area of collaboration between ICBs, our local authority dimension. That's what I've got in mind. Your silence is deafening, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so I think from, from my perspective, there's... Um, if we really want to explore those opportunities, then we need to do it on both sides of the camp, if you yeah. like. Yeah, um, so actually, what are those regional constructs that the NHS needs to be part of? Uh, and, and if we're really going to have those truly collaborative conversations, uh, and this starts to speak to all sorts of elements of devolution, whatever that may be, so I'm using that word cautiously, um, but if we're serious about that, then I agree with you, there needs to be that that dialogue and conversation between local yeah. government and the NHS on lots of different levels. How easy that is to facilitate. No, it's not going to be straightforward, is it? But, but rather than not acknowledging it, it just seemed to me there's a, there's, a, there's a pointer that's worth including in a document such as this. David, what are your thoughts? Well, we're a, well we both are right? non-constituent members of the West Midlands Combined Authority. We are very active in that space. Um, we're looking at the future range and how that might play out. But the, I know that the seven constituent members and their ICBs are intrinsically connected to the West Midlands Combined Authority. Okay. And that's where local governments are playing in that space in okay. a different way, okay. in agreement with your suggestion. So maybe we can play in a different way. But if you look at the way funding and the way um, policy changes will play out, uh, clearly the government wants to speak to less people, less people being mayors, so I think uh, it, it's the policy, it's obvious that the way they want to play that and uh, perhaps we need to be getting into that space in a slightly different way Good to point. protect our strategic direction that we uh, work with. There's also a level of local determination around what those partnership arrangements should be uh, regionally uh, and that's a space that we're, we're in constant conversation with, uh, not only between Taft and Rig but other authorities as well. Um, yeah. so, so we are having those conversations. Um, it, it, it's, it's a movable feast, really, because direction isn't clear, um, but opportunities would seem, that would seem to be the opportunity of devol devolution of some description. Let's, let's keep our eye on that opportunity. Let's see if we can get that, that potential reflected in the collaborative term of reference. We'll leave you to negotiate that with your colleague. Thank you very much, Chair. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Item 23, people, services and functions, which is divided into four parts as set out in the agenda. <coughs> Tracy Hill, I'm not quite sure of your title, or you are Interim Chief People Officer, is that Correct. right? That's right, yes. Good afternoon. I'm Tracy Hill, the Interim Chief People Officer. Um, and I'm pleased to present this paper to you today um, as an update on, uh, on the people function. Um, in, uh, in the ICB. Um, as the Chair has said, there are a number of subsections and I guess I'll just pause each one uh, with the opportunity to open up any conversations or take some feedback if that's okay. Um, so the first item within it relates to the Chief People Officer. Um, this has been subject to uh, consideration and discussion uh, most recently with Chief Executive colleagues, some of which are in the room today. Um, and following that consideration, um, the decision that's emerged from those discussions is that um, the intention is to go out to recruit to a Chief People Officer for Shropshire, Telford and Reekin. Um So I'll pause at that point. Comments? As um, Tracy and Simon know, I'm supportive of the principle subject to First of all, being absolutely clear that there aren't any opportunities to share a Chief of People Officer with another ICS, neighbouring ICS. There probably isn't, but I'd just like to be assured about that. The second, which is potentially um, more salient for us around this table, is the appointment of the Chief, of Chief People Officer has within his or her job description the task of finding ways of unifying and the people functions within the various organisations, NHS organisations in particular, uh, with, the, with, with an idea of bringing those together in a much more integrated way. And the extent to which that might 
also fit with local authority ambitions, I'd be very happy personally to see that as part of the, the, the debate. Is, is that acceptable? I mean, I've talked to many of you around this table about that concept, and no one has demurred. I see lots of heads nodding. So if the ICS sharing idea can't fly, and I suspect it may not, then um, my, my support is conditional upon having that kind of internal integration arrangement. Um, is that Roger's hand? Roger. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I was interested in paragraph three, and it talks about discussions at the Chief Executive Group on integrated food services, which is a, a principle that I support. But I was wondering, Simon or colleagues, could give us a bit more information around the advanced thinking on integration of youth services. So, uh, I mean, uh, colleagues will want to come in. Patricia's got got a hand up, uh, and and Tracy will want to come in. I, I just want to address your point, uh, Chair, as well as pick up on Rogers, then bring Patricia and, and Tracy back in. I think, given where our workforce challenges are as as a system across all of our providers, I think there's something about making sure we've got uh, uh, that uh, absolute leadership role really clearly understood and set out in our system. Uh, that enables us to work across all of our providers and work uh, with Health Education England and work with our uh, 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 training development organisations and local uh, higher education organisations and further education in a way that really starts to get our workforce on a resilient footing. I think the way that we support that individual and support that role is, uh, is more uh, amenable and easier to think about how we share that function, how we share that role across either organisations or across ICB ICBs. So, so I think is a, how do we define the chief people office a bit, and how do we support that with the right infrastructure underneath? I think are two separate conversations, and I think I'm more minded towards uh, the the support functions being linked to our provider organisations, our two local authorities, and a neighbouring ICB in some form of blended approach. Uh, uh, but having a really clear leadership role defined as a chief people officer for Shropshire, Telford and Rican because of our workforce challenges. But I'll, I'll hesitate there. I think it's sensible probably to bring Patricia and, Stace and Tracy. Yeah, I mean, as one of the chief execs that has had that discussion, and I have a clinical background, it's still on the clinical register, but I'm also qualified um, HR professional, not as experienced as Louise Barnett or... Uh, or Tracy Hill, but come with some experience around that HR function. I think workforce is our biggest challenge, as we've just discussed. We're fishing in the same ponds, and actually having our own chief uh, people officer, I think, is important. Um, linked to the previous conversation around the collaborative approach we've got with other ICBs, making sure that we've got chief, chief, chief people officer that's developing the workforce for STW, making sure that we're linked into all of the national training centres in a way that that provides us with an ongoing pool of uh, people uh, to create a sustainable workforce for the future. Um, so, and I think there is, a, we, we also have an issue in terms of the, the, the people functions, in terms of we haven't got that many of them, and some of them are quite technical. And so actually bringing that function together uh, not only creates efficiencies rather than having several onboarding services, people that we're processing folk through through uh, through different different portals. It's more efficient in terms of that back office function. It also means that we can have one clear workforce strategy that's targeted on bringing people in as well as retaining the staff that we've got in a way that doesn't undermine each other, but actually promotes and leads to the to the integrated care strategy uh, that we want for the future. So I think this is the way to go. This isn't new. Carter, the Carter Review several years ago exactly. actually pointed to HR and other, I'm going to use back office function in inverted commas, um, back office functions coming together because there is an economy of scale in doing that. So A, we need those technical skills. B, we, we as individual organisations and small organisations haven't got the resource, the time, uh, um, to, to have that function multiplied several times over. Um, we're all fishing in the same pond. It is, uh, therefore, it makes great sense to have one um, single function that looks at 
how we retain our staff and build a workforce for the future based on our joint clinical strategy going forward. Thank you for your points. Thank you. Um, I just want to bring in Katrina as chair of the People's Committee and also Stacey. Have you got any views about the proposal, this particular proposal? Um, in terms of the um, the Chief People Officer role, uh, absolutely no uh, dissent with that at all. The other thing that sits in the back of my mind is, is the, is the um, awareness of course, that the ICB is an employer and the ICB also has a workforce Indeed. and therefore IC, the ICB also has HR accountabilities and people responsibilities um, and that, that must be included so it's not just about the other NHS organisations, it is about um, NHS STW as well that also critically needs the sorts of skills and resources that this role will bring. Uh, fully supportive of the services element of it and we've already started to have some conversations about that. Um, I have got some concern with the concept of exploring um, for cross ICB and that was purely because of the extent of the challenges um, and perhaps um, sharing with another ICB is something that could be fruitful in the future but I'm deeply concerned that this, the depth of workforce challenges that we face here in STW are such that a people officer sourced from a, a bigger ICB it might be too much of a tag on activity so um, I don't support uh, I don't straightforwardly support <coughs> to another ICB I fully appreciate and I'm aware of the conversations that have happened across the patch to look at a, a provider stepping up potentially appreciate the challenges associated with that, hence why I fully supported the tracing. Uh, but we do have to remember the STW's workforce, they okay. also need support. Your views are clear, Stacey? Yeah, I think um, echo a lot of what's been said, and I think it's a perfect example, isn't it, of looking at what we need now, that short, medium, longer term, yeah. and I think this proposal is what we need now, but I think moving forward with success and the ambition that we've got, I think what we may need <coughs> a year, two years down the line might be um, certainly different. So, But I think that collaboration at provider level, you know, we've got, we're small, <laughs> I look at Patricia and um, what, what, what we require. We shouldn't all be going after the same thing and let's pull that expertise okay. and, and resource together. So on that particular point, the message is clear. We proceed with an appointment which is exclusively for STW. But can I just be assured that, that alongside that there will be a clear statement of intent that describes the internal collaboration between organisations, including the extent to which local authorities want to get involved in this, I think they ought to be involved. It's mutually beneficial for that to happen so that everyone is clear about what they, the people function for the system looks like. I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that that statement of intent is within the current people plan um, as it stands today. Well, I'd like to make, just make sure it features in the job description to, in, in some way, shape or form for the, for the post. Julie? Um, I think the idea of a chief people officer across the um, ICS, ICP is very important. I think we also need to make sure it covers uh, or feeds into primary care, really? both general practice and the wider strategy on, on a number of levels. One is there isn't that function at the moment. Secondly, we've got a lot of plans through the primary care team around sort of workforce. It would be good having those, having oversight to make sure they actually do tie in with some of the wider plans because obviously mm -hmm. there's a lot of money floating around in the ARS mm -hmm. scheme. We need to make sure that's not just pulling workforce from one place to the other. And secondly, also, that we need to make sure that there's coordination to make sure that we don't miss the opportunity of, of spending the ARS money. Because I think this year there's a risk that PCM is going to have to not draw down some of the ARS money, the additional roles reimbursement scheme funding. And that, that's money and resource that's lost to the system. And I think it'd be helpful to have a, a role where they sort of nag PCN CDs to make sure that, that that money is spent and is not wasted, really. Good point, thank you. Um, Liv. Thank you, um, Chair. Just for the information of the board, I just wanted to um, point out the role of Health Watch in terms of people and staffing. Over the years, and increasingly in recent years, 
staff from across health and social care have come to Health Watch to raise concerns about their working circumstances, the, um, their employer, and increasingly um, that is happening since the pandemic to the point where GPs are speaking to Health Watch. So a couple of years ago, we were the first Health Watch, Health Watch Shropshire, to make workforce one of our priorities because of this. Because for me, our workforce are our population. And when they're sharing their experiences, we need to listen to them as well. And so recently, I've been um, trying to understand what is available to workforce when they have those concerns, because that is not the function of Health Watch. And it, what's been interesting is that when I've asked across the system what independent um, providers there are for people to raise those concerns if they don't have confidence in their own internal systems and whistleblowing processes. And that answer has been hard for us to get. Healthwatch Shropshire have added a page to our website specifically for workforce. So I'm really keen to be able to bring some of that into the, the ICB, that, that information that we hold and the challenges that people are bringing to us. And so I have asked if I could go along to the people board and was told that I couldn't. And I just wanted to explain to the board why I made that request. Okay. And so if there could be any dialogue with Health Watch, that would be appreciated. Um, Stacey, could you pick this up outside of the meeting and talk to Lynn and just see how yep. we might accommodate the interests and the intelligence that uh, Health Watch has gathered? That's, yep. that's really Probably. helpful. Okay. So I think we're clear on the first part of this report. Um, the next part is the STW NHS people team. Yes. Um, I didn't... Katrina, did you want to... Uh, sorry, I thought you had your hand up. I didn't want to talk across you. Uh, no, it was just actually to say to Lynn that we, we have engaged with at least one external provider for SAS staff to yeah. go to. And if you're not aware of that, we'll let you know. We so have added can... that to our website. So if the other okay. providers, we couldn't get that. Okay, that's, that's fine. Just, yeah. to, just so you have the information. Okay, thank you. Yes, so um, in relation to the people team, um, that's a central resource that is there to support um, the development and transformational programmes in relation to our workforce going forward. Um, I think as the paper describes, um, historically it's been um, funded on a very temporary basis um, and um, that with it has presented some challenges in terms of securing um, a, a longer term resource to support programmes such as this. Um, we're currently in consideration. There's been a further update since this paper was produced. Um, and we're currently considering the best way to secure some longer term resource in order to provide that central support um, and uh, those conversations are going to, uh, to be picked up again with the chief executive colleagues so I think at a future board chair if that's acceptable um, very happy to present a further update obviously it's important as, as we've outlined in the conversations earlier that there is that resource across the system to deliver on workforce transformation programmes and indeed it's how we work with provider colleagues on that and where appropriate work beyond I would suggest the boundary walls of our own system because there may be some programmes where indeed that is advantageous to Shropshire, Telford and Rekin. Thank you. Yeah, and finally, the final, um, the final um, section of this paper just provides some examples of progress that we are making. So despite resource challenges, um, I am pleased to, uh, to share with the board some of the successes that we are having um, to date. Thank you. I mean, the, as, as Patricia mentioned earlier, we all know the workforce challenge is probably the biggest rate limiter we have in terms of success long-term sustainability and success. Um, and I know this paper was never intended to unpack that big ticket item in detail, but given its, uh, its primacy in terms of its importance for our delivery, I just wonder what, um, what thoughts there are about us having a more substantial discussion about this at a future meeting. Simon? Do you, do you want to give a bit of thought to when that might be? Yeah, absolutely. It'd be great to coincide it with, um, I guess, the um, Integrated Delivery Committee, um, because there's an intention to do a deep dive through that as well, so uh, okay. we could coordinate okay. coordinate that accordingly. And, and, and I think what we'd all ask is, um, be as radical as you, you think you want to be. 
Um, make sure, of course, that the local authorities and others are involved in the discussion. But, but give us a suite of exciting things that we've never imagined might be possible. Because um, I think it's that kind of approach that we really need to take forward. Thank you, yeah. Katrina? Just to say, the, um, in November, the People Committee are, are having a, quite a wide strategy discussion. That's the opportunity. Uh, yeah. Including colleges, third, um, third sector, providers, etc. And I think we've reached out to the councils as well. Um, and so we're really going as broad and as hate to say blue sky, but uh, you know, not, not, nothing, on the, nothing to take off the table conversation. Really? So maybe January? Yeah, yes, absolutely. That would be really good. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, so we're now moving into performance issues. Uh, the performance update including finance, ambulance handover performance, weight and cancer. Um, Claire, you're scheduled to go first. Nicola's not able to be with us today, so I guess, Gareth, you'll be dealing with all of the kind of things Nicola might otherwise have dealt with. But Claire. Thank you. And I, I take the paper as read, so I just wanted to draw the headlines really for people. Um, the financial information in here relates to our month five position. And as you'll see from what we've reported, we are already in a very challenging position with a, a variance from our deficit plan of just over £8 million. Pounds. Um, we, in setting the plan, had already got a challenging second half of the year, I think it's fair to say, particularly with regard to delivery of some of our stretch ambition around our transformation programme and certainly acknowledging the fact that we know that winter isn't going to be easy. Um, so what we have here reflected in the finances, and you'll hear more from Gareth, Gareth most definitely around the operational side of things, uh, is a position where we're already seeing... Um, Concerns arising in the finances that reflect how difficult it is to, to manage at the moment. Um, the drivers, the main drivers of that variance uh, are not a surprise, they're not unknown to us, particularly anchored in our urgent and emergency care pressures uh, and also um, in some of those challenges as I've just set out around the second half delivery uh, of our savings programme. Uh, and certainly at the moment all efforts are focused um, on us really getting to grips with where we think that forecast is going to be and certainly considering what actions we can take both individually as organisations but collectively as a system to try and manage that forecast position. I'm going to pause there but I'm quite happy to take any comments or questions before I hand over to Gareth. Any, any questions, any comments? I mean, this, is, this is difficult. Um, we're just about at the eight, halfway stage of the financial year and we're beginning to see what the year end could look like if, unless we're very firm about the actions that we need to take now. Um, some of us met over lunch, chairs and chief executives, and what um, I've asked the chairs and chief execs to do, all of the NHS organisations, is to focus um, unremittingly on the plans that you agreed at the beginning of the financial year because they need to be delivered and there's some important discussions taking place tomorrow with Claire and the finance directors and next week with colleagues as well. We have to make sure we focus on the delivery of those plans and I might add that includes the ICB as a, an organisation because Simon um, and I with Gareth have had a um, I suppose an in-detail discussion, you would say, uh, yesterday about what the ICB needs to do to balance off its part um, of, of the plan. So, you know, we're held to account for this. Our plans have been signed off, therefore we need to make sure they're delivered. So that's, that's the key focus um, in, the, in the short term. I also ask um, that Robert Jones and Shropcom, who are in a reasonably healthy position, um, you, you, you search your coffers for one of a better term and see if there are other opportunities you can um, give up that will contribute towards the overall uh, position. None of this is easy, but I think it has to be that kind of collective um, approach. And the final point is, we've talked to the two local authorities about the resource that travels in their direction. We've asked for information about how some of that is being used, not least of all in terms of tackling the problems of medically fit for discharge patients. So, so there's a series of actions underway, 
Um, and this, this, is, this is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. Can I just ask you a question for yeah. my, my own education? Everyone else probably knows. In the table on the, the risk, the risk is divided up into the, the trust, the ICB, and the system. I was wondering what the differentiation was used between what's a system risk and what's an ICB risk and what's an individual trust risk. There was an element of the overall stretch for our savings target that we agreed collectively we would add when we were designing the, the final version of the plan, uh, which took us to our £19 million deficit position. Um, at that point, because we didn't have any schemes identified against that where we could easily then allocate that number to a specific organisation, i.e. where the costs would come out, we agreed that we would capture that system risk. So when we consolidate the reports, it sits within the ICB position, but we always show it separately for this reporting because it's really important that we don't lose sight of that and particularly the collective commitment to try and deliver that. Does that answer your point? Um, not really. I mean, I, I think that probably does, but I'm not entirely sure. Then, once we've got, say, mitigations against the, the system efficiency stretch, those mitigations must have plans attached to them. They, do they then move actually into the individual organisations or the ICB where they are? Yeah, the, the plan was always that as we identified the programmes of work, we'd be able to transfer that particular budget requirement to the, the owning organisation, as I say, wherever those savings fall out. Um, part of the reason that that's sat in the risk analysis at the moment is that we don't have those plans in place. So when we look at our reporting, it's the ICB that's carrying that risk, but actually it's a new point collectively we're responsible as a system, so it's, it's the bottom line. That we've got. It has to be reported back in that format, to understand, because that's how it appeared in the original yes. plan. Yes. So yeah. Any other questions from Patricia? In, in, yes, in terms of the ask around um, Shropshire Community and NHS Trust, you know, we will go away and we will look at what we can do to support the system we recognise we're very much part of this system. That said, I think we've got to say, you know, Peach, what, what's going to happen in the next 12 months I think is going to be even more challenging, um, notwithstanding that last week, obviously, in the budget, um, uh, there isn't going to be another spending review. There's going to be an accident with another spending review. Just to make the point, I'm just going to leave it there. It's a political point, but um, our allocations were set, what was it, sort of six months ago at a time when inflation was at 4%. Uh, inflation is now at 11.5%. In effect, our allocations or our budgets have been eroded by 50%. So, you know, it's just making that kind of clear yeah. point that there's a lot in the press at the moment around um, uh, the NHS needs to be efficient and, and for sure we do. We have the <coughs> custodians of the public pound. I'm a Shropshire Telford and Rican resident and patient. It's important that we make sure that we're spending that wisely and effectively. But equally, let's set that in the context of uh, what is going to be a, an incredibly difficult economic position for us as well. So we're going to have to make some difficult decisions yeah. and government are going to have to make <coughs> uh, you, you, you make your point very well, very eloquently. Um, it's, it's pretty clear to, to all of us that a, a, a sizable proportion of our overspend, our overcommitment is linked to things which we would argue are not within our control. You, you make a very strong point about a part of that. So we will argue as best we can about recognition <coughs> for that. It's highly, highly unlikely. But unless there's some, some additional money coming out of the, it wasn't the budget, was it, the, the Chancellor's statement on Friday, um, the best we might expect is some kind of recognition that our deficit plan can be adjusted to take account of that. But we'll learn more um, during the next month or so, because it's that period of negotiation with the centre that results in us having to nail down a plan which will be held to account for, for the end, up to the end of the financial year. That's right, isn't it, Claire? Yes, the plan itself won't shift, but it's not our ability to reforecast. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Okay, thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, ambulance, handover performance, wait and counter. Gareth. Yeah, um, so again, as Claire's described, I'll, I'll take the paper and the appendix is read. Um, there are a number of key points that are worth me just highlighting, given their importance. Um, so in terms of the overall performance on the urgent emergency care uh, uh, portfolio of, of actions, there were some positives to highlight, uh, not least the level of activity going through ESTEC um, at SAF, 
and crucially the percentage of patients that are triaged within 15 minutes, which is a really important clinical safety aspect of the care we provide. Um, but despite some improvements in performance in August around the ambulance handover, we have seen a deterioration during September. Um, there are two specific changes that are being made during the course of September and October, which will work towards addressing that. But it's worth all being aware of the um, significant challenges we have in ambulance handover delays. Uh, two areas that, I refer, um, that are worth highlighting are um, what's known in parallel as the NBT trial, which is um, included within the latest paper, which I'll come on to, um, but it's a um, different way of uh, managing patients through their clinical pathway as they get uh, off ambulance offloaded to ED and then through to wards. Um, a trial was uh, commenced at PRH last week, week before last, um, and commences today at Royal Shrewsbury Hospital in terms of pushing patients through ED to their um, next stage of their care, which will allow uh, a, a, an increased or an acceleration in ambulance handovers. That's work in progress and we're going through a kind of PDSA cycle as you'd expect to see the success of that. Um, there's also an ability for us over the course of the next four to five weeks to recruit paramedics into the ED um, at PRH on the cohorting side, um, which will allow us to care for patients differently as they arrive at the ED department um, and should hopefully make a significant difference in the number of patients that we offload uh, within time. Um, but there's no doubt at this moment that the ambulance handover delays are causing us some concern within the, uh, within the system. On the elective recovery side, um, there was a very slight variance as highlighted in the um, report against the 104-week wait performance. Um, it's really worth focusing on the dynamic that's at play, which is most of the, if not all, in fact all of them uh, for the August position sit with uh, Robert Jones, and it's to do with the complex nature of the patients and the patient choice issues. But what's really important to underline is the over-delivery of activity from Robert Jones in terms of the internal performance and things that they can control is offsetting an underperformance in terms of the mutual aid and the independent sector activity that was part of our original operating plan. So we're slightly off track, but actually I think it's really pleasing to see the work that Robert Jones is carrying out in that area. Um, it's worth, again, underlining a slight check, well, a slight change, a fundamental change in, in the national target position. We had signed up to a system operating plan which had a trajectory for clearance of 104 week waits by the end of February in 2023. Um, that has been brought forward with an expectation of clearance by October. I think we're in a position at the moment where that is not deliverable. Um, and we've been clear with NHSE Midlands around that and some mitigating actions that we will take to try and reduce that as far as possible. But at this point, it's worth all being aware that that remains a challenge for us. On cancer, um, uh, there are three areas really that are worth highlighting. Lung, skin and upper GI are areas which are on track and on plan. Um, we have a uh, slightly off plan around urology and gynaecology but plans in place to bring those back on track by, as we go through the year. But it is worth highlighting some issues around uh, colorectal, where endoscopy capacity uh, on the diagnostic side is that constraint. The mitigation of the work that we're doing on that is to try and bring on stream the uh, FIT pathway uh, so that referrals that come through to secondary care the most appropriate referrals to give us an opportunity to manage demand more effectively. Um, but it is worth colleagues being aware of that. On that basis, I will draw breath and invite questions, and there are other people in the room who may be able to answer in more detail. Any questions, any comments? Um, I said Paul. Lynn, sorry. Hi, I'm happy to go last, um, but if not, um, just to let the board know that Healthwatch Shropshire and Healthwatch Telford and Reakin did a call for people's experiences of ambulance services um, when they were calling in an emergency um, and we closed that um, at the end of last month, of September I should say, and um, we've had 130 experiences from people in Shropshire and eight from people in Telford and the thing that really struck me was when domiciliary care providers were coming to Healthwatch to say the challenge was about falls in the community and the, the problems they had getting people off the floor which meant that they were having to call for ambulances. So I took that to the Shropshire Integrated Place Partnership Board and immediately there was a conversation around the rapid response team but also the two carers and the car service and it was interesting that there were some professionals on that meeting who weren't aware of, of some of that work. So um, I really hope that a difference will be made in respect of those issues that might be adding to some of the ambulance problems. But we'll be bringing a formal report to SHIP and the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you. Any further questions? Julian? Sorry, I do have just two, two points. One's about elective care and about the planning of the profile of the waiting list. Um, one of the things we've seen in general practice for some specialities, the wait for first outpatient appointments is very long. 
Um, neurology is current, the routine is currently seen as people looking into 2024, and a lot of other specialists are looking towards the end of 2023. And I wonder, obviously, that, that needs to be fed into the profile for the 104 week wage and the 78 week wage, because obviously, if they're not being seen for their first outpatient appointment until you know, 2024, you know, from referral now, and then they're being listed, we need to obviously have a plan about how we're going to be able to. You know, move their appointments further through. Um, the only other thing we'll talk about is that urgent care. I went to the urgent care meeting, which is really good to have, and there was attendance from across the healthcare you know, community, which is good from Bristol providers and primary care. But and they talk about the North Bristol model. But on the same day, CQC released their report, which called People First, which clearly said that they actually don't agree with the, the North Bristol model, and that they knew the cases of where energy thing and were forcing that onto systems and making systems do it. I was wondering if we given thought or sat and thought to the tensions that we're, pursuing, we're under CPC monitor, we're pursuing a plan, so there's a plan that CPC don't agree with, albeit that we're being asked to do that. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, sorry, Nick, yeah. Um, yeah, that came up this morning with, and that's not entirely accurate, a CPC report. I understand what you're saying, and I share your concerns as much as anybody about that. Um, situation patients and staff as well find themselves in. Um, CQC report was the output of a round table CQC yes. chaired. So it wasn't a CQC official report as such, it was uh, a group of views. Um, and also when we had the SOAG, the System Oversight Group for Staff this morning, which CQC sit on, we discussed it in detail. Um, I think the CQC at inspect level uh, are more understanding of the situation they're in. So I don't think there's a dichotomy. I don't think we've got what in anything and saying do one thing and so you can see saying no you can't do that. that that's for clarity. However, you know, what we're expecting staff to do in the situation we're putting some of our patients in is ex extraordinary in terms of the risk and some of the avoiding some of the potential um, safety issues. So absolutely right to raise these issues, but I don't think there's a direct conflict. But the situation can't leave some of the patients on UC pathways ambulance waits, what happens in ED, uh, you know, our stage of is incredibly difficult. And I, and I think it's our understanding as a clinician that often you think about the risk of the patient in front of you, mm -hmm. but what we're saying is actually you've got to think about the total risk. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a bit of work going on the Senate recently about it, whether ICBs are a, uh, is a good time to actually reimagine clinical risk and saying rather than thinking about are you just doing the best for that individual patient in front of you, are you doing the best for the population? I think the doctors and other clinicians, <coughs> that's quite a hard and it touches on um, comment about the um, landscape pathway, where the risks sit in the pathway. It's the same for the UEC pathway, and the risks in some places, particularly for the ambulance service, for the patients they get to see, or the patients in the back of their vehicles, or what's happening in the ED, not necessarily the ED majors, but even the ED waiting rooms, patients that to be seen, the risk is extraordinary there, and how we mitigate that risk, and part of the output of the two um, clinical risk sums we held as, as one last Wednesday, wasn't it, and one five weeks earlier, was around everybody in sight and everybody else's risk. Um, one of the pieces of work is coming out with the system wide risk assessment. Each of the organisations within the system has an idea of their own risk registers where the risks sit, actually, in a system wide view of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments, Katrina? The, so the requirements on us from the region to the system to the trust was for us to trial uh, an option of the North Bristol model. So it wasn't to trial the, the North Bristol model as was stated, as was written, but a modification thereof that would be fit for purpose within our organisation. So we did not trial the mathematical model that was shared with us. But what we did definitely trial in relation to what Nick's just said as well is a mechanism by which we could, to an extent, de-risk the ED by increasing the risk within the inpatient ward setting, but in a way that was actually mitigated by making sure the, the, um, the movement was in the patients who were closest to leaving and there were therefore at least risk um, of having their care disrupted as a consequence of the moves. So, um, it, it, you know, we are waiting for the results of it. 
but I was talking to staff today, and one of the things that came across really strongly, which was very interesting, was the sense of community that this that the programme actually gave the uh, those that were involved in in PRH, because for the first time really since wave one of COVID, they felt that together they were dealing with a collective problem. And, and it broke down the barriers of these are my patients and I've got to look after them into one of these are our patients and together we've got to find ways for us to be looking at de-risking our colleagues over here and our patients over here, even if that means taking on some risk myself, because I know I can manage that. And I just think it was a long journey to change everyone's mindset to do that, but it is what's needed in this situation, isn't it? I think the other question was around the long waiting list for first hour patients. Now they feed into 72 and 78 week waiting, 104 week waiting, obviously, as I say. Then again, it comes back to the information being freely available to the public that urology you won't be seeing until October 24, you know, and what to do with if things change and how you actually manage changing situations. But it's, the question was primarily about the impact on those long waits for operation. Gareth, have you got a response for that? I, I do, and Nigel may wish to build or go okay. first. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose the, the, the key bit is um, we know um, that what we're what, doing is supporting our clinical teams, um, and you'll be absolutely aware of this um, uh, from general practice, in prioritising clinical priorities. So we, we have differentiated, obviously, you know, the, the cancer pathways, other urgent pathways as well as routine. I think the other, the other part of it is we know we've got some high risk areas and Gareth have highlighted those. What we are doing is again refreshing all of that capacity and demand activity, I think some of it's mentioned in here, to make sure that we're really, really clear about what we're doing in the short, medium and longer term. Um, it links a lot to, and um, Tracy talked about the different areas of, of workforce, um, it's looking at the different models that we can, that we can continue to employ. And, and it also links ever so slightly to um, as Simon talked about the RCB collaboration, we have, and I know, you know some of my colleagues are fully aware of this, um, developed a provider collaboration, updated that in terms of provider collaborative with the University Hospital of North Midlands. So we are seeking options within this, within the uh, within the system. We work very very closely on MSK in all these different guises, but we haven't got another urology provider that we can, we can work very closely with. Hence, we're working with the UHMA. So it's, it's looking at a range of different both plans, uh, the workforce within that, and opportunities for what we're doing differently. Thank you. Stacey. I obviously can't comment on urology, but I think a really uh, good point, Julian. We've done similar, so certainly in our complex spinal work, um, making sure they've all had first outpatients, because the work that we've done around our longest waiters, we don't know what wave um, to help manage the end point, we've had to go back to make sure we've put a lot of focus and energy into that first outpatient appointment to make sure patients are either going through to diagnostics, being discharged, etc. because of that point. Uh, when you've got so many patients on your books, looking at your 104, 78 week wait point, that was key for us to do that piece of work. So <coughs> at least now we feel sighted, especially on our more complex, where we know we've got less provision, i.e. with spines, that we're really clear on what's coming as well as what, what, what we're currently operating on here and there. Okay. Um, again, this is really difficult. Um, and I think everybody around this table <coughs> would agree that some of the levels of performance that we're able to offer for all kinds of reasons um, to our population, to our patients, are not nearly as good as we would like them to be. So, unashamedly, I think... We need to have continuing, unremitting focus on these access times, if I can call them that crudely. Um, and although we occasionally uh, are uncertain about the value of a target for delivery of an access, an access time, frankly, um, that kind of approach is necessary to really focus our organisation's minds on improvement. And Let's not forget, we are going to be held to account, quite rightly so, for improving the services um, and, and improving access. And we've talked about competing demands and priorities. We've talked about the rate limitation with availability of staff, etc. Nonetheless, this is a priority because it, it, it means a lot to patients and their families. 
And um, I, I suppose, Meredith, a question for you. I was thinking about this in terms of the board, and it's not our job to dig into the last detail of the performance report about this and that aspect of performance, but there is a, there's an assurance responsibility. And I wondered what you thought about the, the quality and performance subcommittee assurance responsibility in this area. Have you any thoughts about that? Responsibility. We get the data coming through, and and where we have questions that uh, can't easily be answered, or, or where, where we're, not, we're not assured by answers, we, we seek further detail and we dig a bit deeper. Um, my concern has always been uh, seeking assurance and, and digging deeper doesn't necessarily give us the answers that we want to hear. So I think. For me, the, the, the question is to highlight where we're falling short and, and, and be transparent about it. Not, not uh, 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 you know, pretend it's all okay, really, when it's not. Um, so I think just being upfront and transparent is, is the most important thing, and that, that is what we aim to do. Um, above and beyond that, I, I don't know. I'm happy to take that question away and ask the committee, what, what more could we do about this? Could you do that? That, that would be helpful on behalf of the board. Yeah. Um, that would be, be really useful. Um, any other thoughts, David? Yeah, it's, it's sort of in reference to the discussion, I was, but I just thought I'd just point out on page 74 around people. And lots of roads lead back to the subject. We've heard that a number of times today in terms of the limiting factors. But what that doesn't say in that paragraph is the context. The context of the scale of the agency that are employed across the system. If I take from a a council perspective, there's a direct correlation as an example between the numbers of agency staff in, for example, children's services across the local government sector and the rating delivered via Ofsted. There's a direct correlation and I know Andy and I work really hard to reduce the number of agency staff. So context is important, um, both in terms of the service provided to our residents I won't say any more than that, but there is a correlation. And the second part is the financial implications. Now that what's been delivered there in terms of that paragraph doesn't make that clear. But the scale of numbers of staff and the scale of the value of it is off the scale. And I just think that should be a focus for our system because I do think we can make significant improvements in many of the things we will talk about today if we can uh, turn the dial a little on that, on that area. It's a, it's a really good point. I mean, just for those who are not familiar with the detail, there is a financial cap on bank and agency spend placed upon trusts or, or systems. It's, it's system, isn't it? It's, system. it's a system level cap. System level cap. And for us, the cap is based on outer spend on bank and agency stuff across the system in the last financial year. If we keep spending this year, for the rest of the year, the rate we've been spending up to month five, we will exceed that cap by 13 million. And there's a question there, constantly in my mind, I'm making David's point in a slightly different way. When activity is not, it's not dramatically increased, acuity doesn't seem to be dramatically increased. Um, why is it that we feel we need to spend as a system 13 million pounds more this year than we did last year? Now part of that could be inflationary, I accept that entirely. Um, and what, what, what I'm looking for um, is for an explanation of that. If there's a rational explanation, then, then let's hear about it. Because I'm struggling, including Mr. Sidhu is as well, to really understand why we are in that position. Uh, remember the discussion we had briefly, got the presentation briefly from Claire about our financial position. Um, a, a sizable part of the overheating is in that area. So if we can arrest that, turn the dials even slightly, it's going to help hugely. And the question is, can that be done without compromising uh, safety uh, and quality? And, and it's absolutely true, David's right. We know that often if an over-dependency on bank and, bank and agency staff might fill a gap in a roster, but it's by no means a guarantee for the right levels of quality and safety. So I realise that this is a bit of a a bit of a controversial area, but it's, a, it's an important area nonetheless. Katrina? Well, I think it goes back to the previous conversation that we had on people and workforce, having a single workforce plan and, and being refocused really on that. Um, the agency costs are the right
rise in agents and costs isn't, let's be clear, this isn't about uh, additional people to do additional activity. Um, the the agency costs is, is filling some sort of gaps in the rentals because of vacancies that we've got. But to be clear, agency costs is it, the premium on agency is around 40% additional to normal salary, mm -hmm. hence mm -hmm. why the cost. So there is an absolute financial gain here in focusing on reducing agency spending. The, 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 the real benefit, of course, is if you've got good skills, consistent staff, quality goes up. We know that, that the higher rates of agency leads to higher mistakes because it's individuals who are inconsistent, they, uh, they don't know the area and therefore mistakes can be higher. So there's a real plus point for us in terms of the quality of care delivery. And there'll be no argument from any of the providers across the system in terms of wanting to reduce agency spend. But I agree with David, we need to have a clear plan and a focus around that. Uh, we also need to be really, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the impact that we, that we've had within, within my own trust in the last six months, we've seen a reduction in 60 and that is because over 50% of my workforce are over 51, with 80% of those between 57 and 60. People are making a decision about, <laughs> um, uh, about my life choices. Furthermore, in the last six months, we've seen the biggest rise in cost of living, which is having a huge impact, which is, again, making people uh, take decisions around uh, life choices. So there's something here collectively as an ICB. We have come together in terms of looking at things like fuel price increase, workshops on managing cost of living crisis, we've invested in Citizen Advice Bureau and uh, Just Credit Union to provide bespoke support to our staff. But there are other things I think we can do collectively in terms of ICB around that workforce offer. Um, but this is, the, this is the reality, we do need to focus and I think we need a sort of a target and a, and a real concerted effort around managing the agency spend because there's a double benefit here, both in absolutely. terms of the public purse and indeed quality yeah, of care absolutely. for the residents. Thank you, Katrina. Um, so, just to reflect on the point that uh, Meredith made, and that is one about uh, valuing transparency over saying what people want to hear. And, and I reflect on what Patricia said, and that is that you know, the agency spend, the bank spend, is not to make our lives easier. It's fundamentally to cover vacancies, it's to cover uh, well-required annual leave, it's to cover training and education that staff missed out on during COVID that they're now needing to catch up on as a core requirement of their professional registration, etc. Um, but in addition to that as well, um, all the work that we've got with the transformations, um, you know, we are having to bring people in. In addition to that, we've got the, you know, the um, escalation areas, because you see activity is not going up. But in actual fact, the number of people that we've got in our organisations is going up. We've got corridors open. They need to be staffed. We get them from agencies. So I wish that the agency staff were coming in to make our, our, our substantive staff's lives a bit easier, because then, yes, it would be a very easy decision to turn them off and to manage that, but we do need to do something deeply fundamental, appreciating the challenges in our, re in our own system to be able to get a, substan a, a level of substantive workforce that is stable with banking agency on top of that as is required. That will take some time to turn that around. We need to work in such a way that we keep that time minimal. But to pretend otherwise wouldn't play to the transparency. So, so I accept the points people are making. We said we'll have a substantial discussion about a, a people plan workforce strategy in the not too distant future. But I still haven't heard an explanation why, during the first five months of this financial year, we've had such an exponential increase in bank and agency staff over and above that which we spent last year. And I can't quite put my finger on what, which of the circumstances that have changed so dramatically that have resulted in that increase in expenditure. I think that's part of David Sidaway's point as well. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's wrong. It might be. I'm just seeking an understanding about how it could have arisen. Um, uh, getting, a, getting a substantive long-term solution to that, I agree entirely, is, is not going to happen overnight. But, but we all ought to be searching 
for explanations about this level of expenditure and other things as well, we, the number of them um, that, that, are, that, that are in our sites for scrutiny, um, because um, we can't really take action unless we understand the dynamics that are creating the situation in the first place. I think, Roger, you wanted to come in? Yes, thank you. I've got experience of the strong guts here, and uh, there's one concern I have, which is around the national frameworks for agency staff. I think I'm not fit for purpose. And I think this is a, an issue which ICS is getting together with across the country to put pressure on the national framework cure. Because it is quite clear that a lot of the cost uh, premium we are paying is because our framework isn't working. I think also, secondly, the trusts are becoming more risk averse around saying, how can we manage our shifts without employing agency stuff? And I think this is a, a matter which I'm to be asking ourselves is what is the decision process we're taking around the agency stuff? Because if I can this organization is just becoming custom practice. Thank you. Um, and I suppose, Roger, thank you. That's part of my point. Are we, are we certain that our processes and systems are as tight as they possibly can be? I make no judgment about that. I beg the question. Um, we could probably spend the rest of the meeting just debating this single issue. Um, but um, we've other things, other business to transact yet. And so my, my suggestion is on that, that, that issue of bank and agency spend, as was you, that, Claire, will be within, within the basket of discussions you'll be taking forward with finance directors and you, Simon, will be pursuing with Chief Exec. It is, yeah, alongside um, a review of our substantive workforce, any slippage in recruitment and all the other things you'd expect us to look at. Sorry? Tracy. Oh, Tracy. Oh, yeah, just to get a response, really. Um, you're asking the question as to why we're seeing the level of act the level of activity from an agency perspective, and um, I think a number of reasons have been surfaced, but I think there are additional ones, um, not surprisingly, um, and the whole workforce big ticket program I think is be is built on addressing these matters. So the three high level objectives of that are to reduce the need for agency spend. So that's coded for recruitment and retention. So that's a whole program of work that's that's underway. The second one is to utilise the workforce that we have more effectively, and that is hinged on rostering. And actually, rostering is one of the reasons why, um, one of the opportunities that we have to use our workforce better, so therefore reduce the need for agency. And then the third one is about, as and when we do have to utilise agency staff, that we do it in the most um, efficient and effective way um, with a commercial mindset. So that may indeed pull in the opportunity around reviewing frameworks. Um, that programme of work, reports through the Integrated Delivery Committee and is on target in terms of its reduction um, in spend at the moment. But with acknowledgement that it's, um, it's back-ended, so we are facing into considerable challenges for the, for the last six months of the year. Um, but a liaison and working closely with the provider organisations about, you asked about processes, about the robustness <coughs> of processes and escalation, etc. So I just felt it appropriate Thank to you. provide the update. Thank you very much indeed. Um, from one challenging area, to another, the urgent and emergency care improvement plan. Thank you, Chair. Um, two areas that I'll cover off. Um, the improvement program and then the winter plan as a subset of it. Um, I'll again take the paper as read. The paper sets out the history of the urgent and emergency care improvement program, which has previously been to the shadow board, so I deliberately haven't included the, the detail. This is around the government's process and the grip that we have on the program that's currently underway. Um, the governance process we put in place under the what is now the Integrated Delivery Committee, uh, chaired by Harry, um, is a step forward for the Agent Emergency Care Improvement Programme. I don't think it's really had that level of focus uh, previously. Um, and what we're seeing from the plan now is the first iteration of reporting against progress. It has identified a number of concerns, which is worth highlighting through to the board. Of the 11 uh, projects within the programme, a significant number, I think nine, are off track. Um, this is the first time we've had the opportunity to review that because it's slightly delayed start to the improvement programme as a result of COVID. Um, so the um, Urgent Emergency Care Delivery Board has asked the Operational Working Group to go back 
put recovery plans in place for each of the areas and report those back to the agent and emergency care delivery board in October. And with your permission, Chair, I'm asking for the ICB to request an update from the agent and emergency care delivery board. I'd suggest we feed that through the integrated delivery committee um, on, the, on the recovery plan, um, which specifically requests the individual organisations to find the resource that they're identifying as um, lacking within their individual programmes. The crux of it is that the plan was set up, a set of resources weren't identified, uh, weren't requested by the individual plans that now are, um, and those resources don't exist within the system, so we're asking that each of the individual plans uh, owned by the organisations find that resource within their, um, their own areas to drive that forward. Thank you, Gareth. The paper refers to coming to, I think it's suggested, come to the board in October. Uh, so I was going to recommend we take it to the Integrated Delivery Committee and set up the board. Um, I, I thought the paper set out a very good set of actions. Um, if, if, if we could deliver all of, the, all of those, we'd be in a one strong position. So it's got to be, again, my point earlier about focus, and unremitting focus. Um, Organisations, systems, primary care really need to get behind the wheel for this to see how we can improve um, our arrangements. Is there anything else you want to say? No, I, I think that's a really important point. Other than the um, NBT model, next patient first, uh, your next patient, sorry, model, and um, the cohorting uh, that we described earlier on, your point about this being a good set of actions is really important. What we don't want to do is divert away from this plan. It would be really easy to layer in a load of other new things, but actually we need to focus on this plan first. If we can deliver this, that's a massive step forward for the system. Uh, the next part is the winter plan. Um, I'm seeking approval uh, for the winter plan set out in uh, the appendices. Uh, there are three areas worth highlighting. I'm just filling as I pull up on my screen because um, I can't make find the right place. Um, uh, the first part is, or the first area to highlight is the system wide working approach. So the winter plan was developed off the back of a system wide workshop in June, which included um, stakeholders from the entire system. That's then worked through a number of existing. Um, uh, groups so that we're not putting in another set of meetings into the into the ICS. Um, we've worked with all the partners. This has been then reviewed by the chief operating officers and signed off for approval by the chief executives last week with um, a couple of conditions attached. First condition is a weekly tracking of the capacity and demand model uh, so that we're really clear that we're on track with what's contained within the winter plan and the foundation behind it. And the second and most crucially is the plan sets out a shortfall of 41 beds. While there are a number of different issues around the plan, the currency of the acute bed position is vital within it. We currently have a shortfall of 41 within the um, uh, most likely model. Uh, so Chief Executive have quite rightly asked for um, a search plan that would address um, the shortfall, what actions can be taken um, to mitigate that as we go through the year. Um, there are also a number of small, small number of areas that are due to be highlighted that aren't critical to the winter plan itself. But on the basis of the conditions from the Chief Executive and the small number of gaps, Um, are, we, are we being asked to sign this off? In other words, check out the commitment to this plan from all of the bodies represented around this table. Exactly that. Are people content to sign this off? No? Yeah. Um, so, so, yes, obviously, you know, I know that, uh, as, as Gareth described, I think given the discussion that we've just had about the urgent care pressures and performance, um, and notwithstanding the point that we've just been describing about financial pressure to maintain escalation areas, as, as, as Katrina said, then obviously from a SAF point of view, then this can still contain risk. Um, and, and hence the point about the plan for so plan. So we're absolutely working with, with all, all members of the ICS in terms of that, that pre-hospital side, obviously all the work we've got internally, things back to the urgent care improvement plan. And obviously then the out of hospital capacity for discharge and also with the local authorities and, and others. So I think it would just be from a from a SAF point of view, I just wanted to, to so, um, note that point. Qualifies, not disagreeing. Qualifies. I may build on that chair. Um, so I think implicit in what Nigel's described just described are two risks. Uh, the first risk is the some of the assumptions that the capacity and demand model are built on. They are included within the paper. It's worth highlighting the MFFD position is baked in at the current level of approximately 145. It might be 148 in the paper. 
Um, but that obviously fluctuates and is volatile, can go up and can go down. If that deteriorates significantly, that will have a significant impact on the position, as will the impact of flu, COVID, um, norovirus through winter. We have planned for um, the historical rates um, from January 2020 through to current, with the exclusion of the highest piece of COVID. Um, but we know, as we were discussing earlier now, uh, that the rates in Australia are significantly worse than potentially uh, we have within the model. We have baked into the plan a uh, higher risk scenario, uh, which has to something like minus 80 more beds. Um, and if that does play through, that is worth highlighting as a plan. Just, just as well. Thank you. Katrina. I, I am alarmed by the activity was low. It said it was remarkably flat, level, unchanged, steady. That was the meaning that I think okay. is low. Um, but uh, the, the, so it's, which means we're not with great room to have much flexibility. So, so, so qualified, sound right, but qualified I'm support really from SAT, subject to the caveats that you've raised. Um, I'm looking to Shropcom, MPFT and Robert Jones. Are you broadly comfortable in this? Comfortable? Are you broadly uncomfortable in the same way? I, are you supportive but subject to the same kind of caveats? Well, it's going to be a challenge, I think. Yeah. I mean, we have to acknowledge that. And um, obviously, Shotcom's main contribution is through the reablement beds and also um, increasingly on virtual wards. We're very, very committed to that and very keen on it indeed. Um, not just because um, it, it, it well, because it's better for the patient as well as, you know, it's much better for the patient to stay at home than to end up in a hospital bed, and especially with the high rates of infection that there are at the moment. Nursing patients at home is a much better alternative. We're very committed to that. Um, we will be challenged to provide it um, as requested, uh, mainly by the numbers of staff that we've got, and um, I think that's, that, uh, you know, that... That's the concern. But in terms of signing up to the plan, with those caveats, I'm, I'm looking to my okay. chief exec as well. I'm sure we, we are quite supportive. We're comfortable in an uncomfortable way. Yes. <laughs> uh, Paulie, it's a bit unfair to ask you, as this is your first meeting, you, you're new to the board of MDFT, but, but have you any, any observations, any thoughts you want to offer? I would say I'd be confident to offer support and qualified with the bit that I don't know about in the organisation, but I think there's no other opportunity than to go ahead and support it. Thank you. And uh, Robert Jones? Yeah, similar. I think I liked Patricia's uh, <laughs> stance on it, but yeah. And the local authorities? Again, the same sort of caveats. The future is certainly uncertain. And primary care? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure which of you went with it. How do we admit it? I've just got one question about the, um, the 500 hours of extended access appointment. Um, because we are, the extended access and extended hours, when it became amalgamated, the 
actual overall capacity hasn't changed over time. This is the existing capacity as it is now in the system. So it's not an extra capacity uh, for this, for, for winter. So, so there is within, and it may not have made it back in terms of confirmation through the channels just yet, we've just slightly <coughs> completed, and it's included within the paper, I think, the um, funding exercise for the, uh, the winter plan uh, support, which will include additional funding for GP access. Um, there's, within it, I think there's £400,000 that are allocated to additional appointments. Uh, that was prioritised jointly with social care capacity, um, so additional um, beds into both Tavern Regan and Shrewsbury. Uh, uh, so there is additional activity being built into that, but I can confirm that separately to you. Um, sorry, I was going to um, part about how these appointments can be, um, the extra appointments, extra capacity can be uh, delivered. I think there's got to be a level of co design of general, general practice to how it's going to be delivered in the most effective way. Because I'm looking at the paper, I'm just thinking about how it, how it can be a bit more specific about targeting what we're going to do with the money. Um, you know, historically, we're talking about hot clinics, but largely have not been materialised in such an effective way. So I think perhaps that uh, conversation we can, we can continue about outside and develop this. I you know, 100% agree. Yeah. The, the, um, I think we need a more targeted approach because I think the review of last year's delivery had some of it not as productive as we would want it to be. Um, so um, Santali, who's leading this, is working with Emma and Primary Care Science to make sure we're targeting it, targeting it in the right way. We were receiving that bill, I wasn't thinking actually we into a different type of appointment, but I can pick that up later. The sun. I think Julie was before. I'm the, oh, only other, yeah, the only other thing I was going to add was about the advice that came out this week from NHS England around the changes to the IAF funding and the AOS funding within the sort of network you know, and specification. Because there's some elements within that where it details about recycling some of that money into supporting increased access in primary care. I'm not entirely sure what that means or how it's going to be done or how, yeah, in terms of increasing access, but obviously that's could be on top of the, the money already allocated within the system as well. So I think I landed two days ago. Yeah. yeah. That. So uh, yeah. I think we're working through the, the implications of that, Julia, in terms of mm. what does that letter actually mean? Because I'm not sure it's entirely clear. But we've got to work through it. Yeah. The, the bit I was going to say, uh, Chair, sorry, uh, uh, was <coughs> I, I make no uh, apology for wanting to bring this plan here to the board like this and to do the round the table uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, this, uh, I, I've heard clearly from Chief Exec colleagues that in previous years there's been a pl plan that's been brought forward that didn't clearly articulate the bed gap in a way that people understood and could see transparently uh, and, and equally uh, a plan was taken through a governance process that was done at a system level that didn't tie back into individual organisation governance processes uh, uh, to get that commitment and, and sign off. So uh, uh, in listening to that, I've been, and uh, I've probably driven Gareth mad in this regard in terms of uh, writing and rewriting this plan because I wanted clear tables that said, here's the modelling of the scenarios, uh, worst case, most likely case, uh, absolute clarity on the tables within there that show what that bad gap is, and then absolute clarity of uh, this having gone through organisational governance processes so that when it gets really difficult, we don't do the, oh, well, I never sign it off, we do the, how do we resp respond to the challenges that are within there, and that the organisational commitments is really clear. So Newell and Patricia have articulated what the Shropcom bit is in the same way as Nigel's done the, the uh, and Katrina have done this is what it means from a SAP perspective, etc., etc., etc. So I just want to be really explicit that... Uh, this uh, has that organisational ownership with the caveats around the, you know, we're signing off a plan that still needs the surge uh, uh, work done uh, to deliver that. But our focus then will be on delivery of this and the elements within this that each organisation is owning, as well as the additional work that we've said then we need to, to, to do to underpin it. So, Katrina. One oh, last question. Um, with regards to the plan, thinking about medical
because that particular must have been kept incorrect. So have we got, are we actively thinking about how we can support our, you really don't want to be hospital any longer patients um, who at, at the last moment prove um, black flow positive because of course we have to do all this other additional. There was a piece of work completed around COVID designated beds which was actually counted to national guidance that and right. Vanessa is nodding she was heavily involved in the risk assessment around it. Um, so we've taken a deliberate approach to uh, commission COVID designated beds. I'll be honest with you, Katrina, I need to go away and confirm whether those have actually come on stream yet or not, but that's very definitely part of the week. Okay, because that, that will just, that will be one more block in there. We've, we've, we've put aside a little bit. Thank you. That's good. Meredith, I think <laughs> you wanted to come in earlier. Thank you. Uh, uh, Patricia covered it. I was just... Um, wanted to make sure that we were completely up to speed with the virtual award contribution to the winter plans. Uh, uh, we heard from Claire Horsfield of the Quality of Performance Committee uh, that they kind of, uh, the approach being taken was, was, was for the, the target to be erring on the side of conservative to make sure that we didn't over, uh, uh, over expect, I think, what, what virtual award Okay, thank you. So, um, Gareth, did you want to say any more about ambulance handovers? In what context, sorry? Well, yeah. it's just it's on the agenda, winter planning. Uh, I think we covered it as part of the... Have, have you covered yeah. it satisfactorily? Yeah. Okay, um, again, this is, this is trying, um, but we've got an understanding between ourselves about the integrity and the status of our winter plan. The, <coughs> the surge planning process is clearly important to everybody here and also for um, clinicians. So Gareth, you need to keep us posted about how that develops. Um, and um, let's see how we fare. Thank you. Committee reports. Um, we're going to rapidly run through these if we may. First of all, um, an apology to you, Harry. The Integrated Delivery Committee item hasn't featured on the agenda. I think there was an oversight. Yes. Apologies for that. Was there anything you wanted to report from that in particular? What I would like to do for my view is just position the committee because it's, it's a slightly different approach than what we've had in the past. I think it would be really important that all of the board sign up to the its approach, otherwise we'll, we'll end up sort of bumping into each other. So if I may just talk for, for two minutes. So you recall the, the three pillars that we in the government's have to sign up, um, strategies, delivery and issues. This sits in the middle, it's a delivery committee. I think that's an important point because it's not an assurance committee, which perhaps you normally associate with a dead chair. Yeah. It's not, it's a delivery committee. <laughs> I think it's really relevant now because of all the reasons we've discussed around you know, our plans or halfway through the year, government, winter, and it, we really try and bring some priority and delivery and to use your word, focus on some of the deliverables. Um, we're, we are only really holding people to account for delivery. And, it, and we, we started off gently, but we will be ramping it up as we go through. Um, there, will, there is certainly a learning curve for people because um, you know, we've had to work on the terms of reference so people understand what the expectation is of them. Some of the papers fell short, some were fine, but we've got to get everyone to a, a good standard to begin with. Um, and it, usually, when you hold people to account, you rely on the line management, don't you? We haven't got that. This is a partnership. So it's in a test relationship. That's why I think the whole board needs to be signed up to, to, the, pro to the process. We will take a pragmatic approach to it, um, and Gareth and I will constantly look at the terms of reference and the membership to make sure it's fit for purpose. But um, we, we, we do want to make a difference, and we like to make a difference by us all, but we will need to sort of be part of account. Um, we're going to look at my proper business process, so what are you going to do, when are you going to do it by, how will you have done it, and then we'll hodge to account for that. And we will do a number of deep dives. So I think all the areas that we, we've talked about, we've covered around the winter plan, um, the um, financial plan, the uh, big ticket items, um, and the um, efficiency targets, and the urgent care. Uh, targets. We've asked for more information to come back, and we will be doing a deep dive on the big ticket items each, each one, so we can give proper um, confidence around the delivery. 
there were a couple of items that we were really confident were in the delivery. One was the vaccination. We had a great presentation from Michelle Q, isn't it? Um, New yeah. Really good. So we're absolutely confident in the delivery of that. And we also have signed off some requests for two um, procurement uh, activities with our tactical commission, which again, we're confident. But so it was, a, it was an okay start, but there's more to do to get it to really deliver. That's really helpful, Harry. And I just want to check with board members that you're comfortable with the style, the approach that Harry has been asked to do, uh, and how he's described the, the modus operandi of that committee. Are you okay with that? Katrina's looking at me. No, it's okay. You're going to get something similar from me, but I talk about the full committee. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Use it to my ears. So I do, I do not disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thanks very much indeed, Harry. Uh, Finance Committee, um, Trevor isn't here, are you covering? Yes, sort of please. Um, so we've got a paper here which is the update from the first meeting of the Finance Committee and I can also do a quick verbal update from the Finance Committee that was held this morning which Trevor chaired but I've agreed to, to, to feed back. Uh, I think uh, the, the issues that we discussed are the, the issues that we've talked about here so I'm not going to repeat them but I did need uh, to bring to the board's attention the review that we did of our terms of reference and particularly today I'm looking for support um, for us to sign those off or for the board to sign those off so that we can um, continue with the development of the committee. Now some of the changes were very practical, it was just making sure we'd got uh, a, a clear line of sight and a read through, through the terms of reference. We've made sure it's tidy in terms of the subcommittee so it's We've got all that clarity. The, the key area of focus for us, though, was a really good discussion about the membership of the committee. So, first of all, we are making a proposal that, rather than it being very much a management-led committee, which is how it's been set up, um, we'd like to invite the finance committee chairs or equivalent um, from each of our partner organisations to sit on the system part of the meeting. Um, those conversations have been had through DOFs, it's very much an open door we're pushing which is absolutely fabulous and is going to give us a, a richer debate than, than we may achieve without. Um, the second proposition around membership is one that Neil, you Simon and I discussed with, with Alison a few weeks ago. Um, I felt, and, and with the conversation with Trevor and others, Trevor is very exposed as a system NED because he's the only system NED on that committee. Um, now for him to chair and engage in the conversation and do all the other things is very difficult. Um, there are some issues around introducing an additional NED to this board which make things very complicated and actually probably won't do the job and what we need. So certainly what we're recommending and we're seeking approval for today is for the addition of a, a, a lay member support not just for the finance committee because actually we need somebody that's engaged in the broader agenda not just the numbers uh, who can come and add some additional non-executive challenge into those discussions so uh, a proposition we need to develop further but certainly they would be supporting the finance committee um, we'd be looking for for example a quality and performance committee perhaps but certainly around that, that assurance space i'll pause there before i just go into the update from today's meeting if that's okay how do, how do people feel about that? Comfortable with that? Where do okay. we've so much to learn from the local authorities in terms of finance? So, are the local authorities playing to the finance committee? They are. Both of the Section One Five One officers are members of the committee. <laughs> it's like the it, I know. I always say that but they don't refer to themselves as finance directors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? Um, and, and so far, either themselves or a representative has attended. Um, one of the reps uh, actually helped us with some of the feedback around the terms of reference, Excellent. so we made sure we got reference to local authority and the part that they play in that discussion. So very helpful so far. So having an additional NED is really not an option that we can take forward. Having a lay member is, 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 is an alternative and a possibility. Are you comfortable that we ask... Um, the executive will want to be better to, to work that up in more detail. Yeah, good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll keep it short in terms of the update from today. We had a look at the month five position both in our part one and part two meetings, so ICB and ICS. 
Uh, I think the, the takeaway from today, now that we're starting to get into the, the discussion about what's driving some of the numbers, was very much that Trevor has asked us to come away as a management team and really think about how we describe the actions we're taking. So we've got a very good representation of what's driving the problem, where the finances are heading. The challenge now is for us to be able to say, and what are we doing about it? It's the so what. Uh, we had a very constructive conversation about who and how we hold to account, so certainly I can start to see the relationship between the finance committee seeking assurance from the executive, but also how we might to start having that relationship between some of the other committees, so certainly the integrated delivery committee, um, and fits perfectly with what you were describing, how we will be able to take some of that feedback through to hopefully provide assurance to that committee. Good luck, Emma. Thank you very much indeed, Claire. Thank you. Stuff. Quality and Performance Committee, Meredith. They're principally bringing the board up to date with uh, meetings that sometime goes in May, June and July. Um, so I, I don't think there's anything specific that I wish to write <coughs> in those uh, reports. I'm very happy to take questions on anything that arises. We did have the Quality and Performance Committee this morning. We're going to try and um, uh, uh, arrange things so they were a little more contemporary. Um, so uh, w one important development in, in our approach is that uh, unlike most meetings, we're going to have the risk register at the top of the meeting and the agenda is going to be driven by the, the, those risks that uh, are, are, are feature as, as red and which need attention uh, rather than calling them and then forgetting about them at the end of the meeting. Uh, so that, that's an important thing. We did, uh, uh, with one or two small members, to do our terms of reference, so that, that will be the board, so that's what's resolved now. And um, particular areas uh, that we picked up today uh, was uh, the recovery of dementia targets. We was uh, slipping quite a long way behind our, 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 our dementia, uh, so we've got a recovery plan around that. And just on that point, I think. Um, uh, anyone listening into this meeting who didn't know would, would think that the Integrated Care Board didn't, didn't uh, deal with mental health. Uh, and uh, I would just like to um, make that observation, hold a mirror up and say uh, we, we might need to um, address that as we go forward. Uh, just occurred to me. Yeah. Um, otherwise, no, nothing, nothing else that I want to draw to the board's attention. Thank you. Just if I'm on the mental health point, um, we were um, recognising the point entirely um, based on the performance report rather than the quality uh, report. Um, we set a session up with our mental health colleagues to make sure that we're reflecting everything we should through the performance report and we can play the quality aspect of that in as well. Um, so that we'll fight apart what we do. Any questions for Meredith? Um, the audit committee. Roger. Thank you, Jen. Uh, before we begin, I spoke to the voice because of the delay and the messaging. And there's only two things to bring to the board's attention. First of all, is the concern that the committee has over our strategy and strategic objectives. Um, we do need in place a strategy and the objectives in delivering a strategy and we do need the supporting risk management framework to assess the risk around that and at the moment I think it's fair to say that we don't have that in place and as a working committee we would hope that that would be that framework would be developed quite quickly uh, to ensure that all the various elements of the ICS's um, objectives and the key pledges and aims that we have are properly placed in a governance framework. And at the moment, it's early days yet, but I think I'm just raising a concern that we do need some uh, development of that framework fairly quickly. Even, even if it's at an initial stage and then an outlook stage, I worry at the moment is that um, we are focusing very much on operational matters, which I understand, but I do feel we need a strategic framework and a risk management framework to oversee our key objectives around inequality, um, economic generation, etc. etc. 
Thank you. Thank you. Sammy, did you want to make any response to that point? Uh, uh, only that we pick that up as an action, uh, Chair, and uh, uh, Nicola, as the exec director that covers that, uh, will be uh, on that piece of work, and we need to then bring it back through the audit committee and then bring it back here so that we've got that broad assurance framework uh, aligned to the strategic four priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, People Committee, we, we can't wait, Katrina. Thank you very much. So the, the People Committee met for the first time in this format uh, last week, the week before? 14. Was it? That's good. Um, now, the People Committee actually sits under the strategic arm of the system um, and not under the assurance arm. Um, and therefore, we've got a, a mixed remit of strategic oversight as well as classical assurance. Um, in addition to that, as we mentioned earlier on, of course, the IC, the, the system is an employer in its own right, and therefore the system requires a mechanism by which it's, uh, some of its people elements can also be reviewed, uh, approved, etc. So the people uh, committee will play that role. Um, therefore, when we looked at our terms of reference, um, we looked at our purpose within those two frames, one being as a strategic committee, but the other one being uh, having some accountability towards um, delivering some of the key assurance elements of it. Um, and we modified our terms of reference and re um, with reference to that, including conversation about membership, core membership, and also a much broader mix of attendees um, to make sure that we were having voices from all of the stakeholders that will have influence on shaping the future uh, workforce or across the whole system, as they put in the, um, the, the third sector, including the edu further education universities, including councils, primary care as well, raising the question about how we involve the primary care beyond just GPs, as someone pointed out, actually thinking about how we look at the workforce and its totality. Um, and our first meeting, main meeting, is going to be sometime in November. Um, at which point we will be having a strategy discussion looking at ways, looking at our workforce um, in line with the work that Stacey's already been kicking off with Tracy over the last week while um, and then moving forward with looking at the, commi the committee work that's ongoing and in addition the strategy elements. Thank you very much indeed. Any questions? Thank you. Primary Care Commissioning Committee. Nitty. We haven't got anything to report. Nick, you were you chaired the last one, right? I wasn't there for the last one. We've got another one next week, so I don't know whether you've watched report on the last one. Um, the report stands for itself. I mean, the primary care commission again sits under that strategy pillar of the three pillars, um, but it also does have some sort of delegated commissioning functions, which carries out part of the ICB with regard to um, financial spend. Low spend tend to be more strategic in investments than. Um, Sort of day to day business as usual runnings. So there's always been two parts more of the update of the situation where primary care is within a system, and the second part, which is more commercially sensitive um, purchasing decisions. Thank you. you okay with that, Nitty? Yeah, I, I think we're just we're figuring out, and we're, we're setting up, and thank you again for your help in helping us with that. Uh, it's just we're figuring out you know, what gets onto the agenda, what's statutory, what's not. Uh, what kind of risk registers do we need to review there? Uh, and I, I think in line with strategy, it will evolve and change. Uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, Neil, and I asked for a discussion with yeah. you around this, so we'll, we'll chat about that. Currently, as it stands, it's fine. Next time, we'll have a, a better report for you. Uh, with kind of not, not better, we'll have more comprehensive report. Thank you, very much Thank you Nick, for chairing in my absence. Much obliged. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nitty. Um, Finally, Remco. Um, Trevor chairs, but he's not here, of course. So, Tracy, you're. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Presenting this on behalf of Trevor McMillan. Um, it's a summary of the uh, the matters that were addressed at the meeting on the 26th of August. I think they're pretty self explanatory from what's down there, but very happy to pick anything up if people would like. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Meredith? Thank you. Um, Perhaps the most significant issue discussed was the, uh, the arrangements, the procedures for the uh, uh, recruitment of our uh, chief executive officer. Um, 
and uh, everything seems to have gone a bit quiet, so I'd be quite pleased to hear uh, an update on it. Uh, lucky we are, of course, to have uh, our interim arrangement, but uh, uh, just the plans for the, uh, for the recruitment of this substantive role. Uh, thank you, Meredith. Perhaps I can deal with that. Um, we sought um, approval on the 29th of June with the regional office to be able to proceed with the appointment. And uh, despite various discussions about it, um, we still await the green light to be able to get on with the recruitment process. Um, I know some of the reasons why there's been a delay um, and I'm promised some kind of response in the, in the near future. Um, and um, I echo Meredith's comments, we're, we're very fortunate in having an excellent interim, but for the purpose of certainty and clarity, I think we're all agreed um, that it would be good to be able to make a, a substantive appointment um, at the earliest opportunity. So thank you, Meredith. We'll, we'll keep it under close review as we have done for the last three months. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, can I just, uh, just not on a specific committee, but on the sort of broader governance arrangements. Clearly, the arrangements we have within an ICB, because of the complexity of the relationship, is more complex than perhaps you'd see in a provider organisation. Um, and you take certain actions in a provider organisation to make sure you've got relationships horizontally across the committee so things could be passed. I'm just wondering whether there's an opportunity as one of the Deloitte sessions just to explore that so we understand how we pass things around, who does what, etc. So I just think otherwise we could have a look at perhaps a potentially dysfunctional governance arrangement, which is the last thing we want. I totally agree with you. Uh, I think it's really, really important, and that's what we were struggling with in the committee as well. Yeah, let, let's pick that up as part of our development work. Um, and can I say I'm really pleased to hear the progress you guys have already made with the subcommittee. So the, really getting sleeves rolled up and getting into um, the business as we'd hoped you would. The strategy committee, or whatever we call it, is still to be up and running. What do we call it? It is, Neil, and we did in fact have a, a date with, yeah, which co coincided with uh, exactly. uh, the Queen's funeral, so that's, uh, and it, it, we struggled to get that date. This is one of the difficulties, I suppose, that we're asking a lot of already very busy people to give up more time, and just coordinating those diaries proved very difficult, so we are awaiting the So we'll, um, we'll do what we can to help get that meeting set up at the earliest opportunity. So, so well done everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Um, with a, a series of papers in the pack for information only for noting, not going to go through these. Just the one I would draw for everybody's attention, which is important reading, they're all important, but particularly the publication of the Independent Inquiry into, sexual, into Child Sexual Exploitation in Telford. David Sidaway and his colleagues have been dealing with this, uh, of course, um, and there's no specific actions for us to consider today, but, but please try and find time to read it. It's, it's a really important uh, document. David, did you want to, to say any more about it than that? Um, I haven't been notified of any of the business. Date time of next meeting, the 30th of November. Um, between two and five, when we'll be the guest of a renowned season ticket holder at Shrewsbury Town Football Ground, Dr. Povey. <laughs> For that is where we're meeting um, in uh, November. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.